six months ago in real life and 1013 days ago in game, I spawned into this world for the first time. And the place where I spawned in is over here somewhere, roughly just out of sight of the island I was just on, somewhere behind me in the middle of the ocean. A bit like this. It wasn't the ideal place to spawn, but playing create mod with a survival island spawn seemed like a good challenge to take on. And over a thousand in-game days later, it's time to tell you the full story all over again. Welcome to my 1000 days in create mod movie. Mr. Beardstone's perfect world mod pack includes McCaw's bridges, storage drawers, drawer statues, framed blocks, farmer's delight, and of course create mod, not forgetting sophisticated backpacks and Alex's mobs. And among other things there's a quest system to help you navigate all the way through all of these things, so let's get started and see where we end up. A guaranteed disaster. And the answer is we end up in an ocean, of course we do. All I can do is pick a direction and swim for it. There's an island, it doesn't look like it has any trees on it, but I should be able to get some wood from that shipwreck to the left. I reach the island and check out the local wildlife, and then just by arriving at the shipwreck, I complete my first quest. Wow, well that, that was easy. <laughs> Raiding the first chest isn't too difficult, and there's some decent loot in there too. But I want to take some doors with me to raid the deeper chests. So I stand on the blocks that are only one layer of water deep and I break a few of those. To be honest, I only needed one block to make a small platform to stand on in order to get some of these jungle logs. And as soon as I pick up the first one, I can tick off two more quests. Now I can make a crafting table, which completes another quest. And with that, I can make some doors, which are going to help me to raid the rest of the shipwreck. And that whale is huge. Below decks, the food chest has lots of goodies for me. And the map chest, well, that's not quite so exciting. Although I've got some wood from the shipwreck, the only way to have a sustainable source of wood is to grow some more trees, so I'm going to need some saplings. For that reason, I've decided to make a boat and go exploring. But before we do that, let's have a look at our quest book and pick up our rewards for the quests that we've completed. Some of these awards give us a choice of logs that we want to receive. I'm going to pick mangrove every time because, well, why not? I'm arriving at this island now and it's not much better than the first one we found. I think I'll just grab this sugar cane and move swiftly on. This third island looks much more promising though, it has a tree. But the sun is going down, I've got no bed to pass the night with and I'm a little bit worried about what the night is going to bring. There is at least a tiny bit more food on this island and there's another tree. So I'm going to chop this tree down, grab these wild carrots and head over that way. Oh, this island is absolutely tiny. Right now that's a good thing though because it keeps me safe from mob spawning during the night. I don't think it's safe to go and explore the other islands right now so I'm going to dig down instead and that means making my first pickaxe. And that's another quest completed. I'm unstoppable! Let's stick down here and see if we can find some good resources. Our first bit of cobblestone completes another quest, so that's a good start. But a bit further down, it appears the island is not joined to the seafloor. Who does that? There is some iron down there though, and we've still got our doors on us from the shipwreck. But first we need a bit more cobble, so that we can make our first stone pickaxe. And of course, complete the quest for it. That means we can now mine our first iron. Let's get that smelting. Farewell first pickaxe of the series. I'll pop these saplings down here too. And while I'm here, I'm gonna grab this copper. Another quest done. Diving down a bit further with my trusty doors, I find some andesite. And I know how useful that is in create mod. So we are gonna grab some of that. With that done, let's head up to the surface now because I can see that it is now daylight. Oh look, there's pumpkins on the island. These are now my pumpkins. I'm just going to grab a bit of kelp because I know I'll want that later on. I'm exploring a bit more and these islands look pretty close together. The sea between them is really shallow so I could place some dirt to join them up and make one big island. Yep, I've decided that's what I'm going to do so I'm heading back to where we were to get our stuff and head over there. But I can see one of our saplings has grown. It's one of those big oak trees, so I'm definitely going to want an axe to chop it down. And that means completing yet another quest. Hooray! 
I'm just adding a waypoint on the map to our new destination just to make sure we get there okay. That definitely makes it easier to spot and it looks like there's some stuff floating on the water over here so let's grab that while we're here. The first thing to do now we've arrived on our new island is to plant these saplings and get them growing. And now let's fill this water in. I uh, fell in. With all the crops that we've managed to pick up from that shipwreck and the other islands, I think it's right to make some farmland and actually start farming them. So I'm making a hoe to do that. And look at all those quests we've completed. That's because the hoe quest leads on to the crop quests. Another crop I have is sugar and I'm going to plant that around the edge of the island like this. Meanwhile, it looks like my next door neighbours have got a visitor. I don't want those orcas mistaking me for a seal, so I'm going to make sure I've got somewhere safe to go underground. And besides, there's more resources down there, so let's go and find them. Oh, it looks as if I've stumbled across a cave. I'm just going to grab this iron, and then there's a few other resources I've spotted down here that we're going to need an iron pickaxe for. <laughs> Oh, there goes my axe. Ah, it's a spawner. I thought there were quite a few zombies. Well, this spawner might come in handy later on. Oh, here we go. What, three of them together? I need to run away. Now, let's get this bit of redstone. And this bit of gold. Raw gold quest completed. We've actually completed a lot of quests, so while we're here, let's collect our rewards. Back up here on the surface and the orcas are back. Now, I don't know if those things will ever attack a player, but I don't really want to find out because I won't stand a much of a chance against them in my current state, should they choose to attack me. So what with them and the phantoms at night time, I think I need to build a house that I can feel safe in. I think we can start exploring the bit of create mod. So here on the create mod basics quest, first thing to do is to say yes, we want to start learning create. And that gives us some XP nuggets. And we also get a qualified engineer advancement. The next thing we need to do is create some andesite alloy. We can just click on it here in the quest and it will show us all the ways we can make it. Some iron nuggets and some andesite and there we go. Now we can grab our reward and let's see what else we can make. Now that we've got loads of create bits and pieces, let's try and join them together to put them to good use. If I get some flowing water in this trench, we should be able to get a water wheel in it. But I guess that wants to be a block higher. Let's try again. 
that's more like it. And in fact, we've got two of these big water wheels, so we can do exactly the same thing next to it. Round on the inside, we bring the shaft through. I connect that to a big cog, join that one up to a small one, and on goes the mechanical press. The depot goes on the floor underneath it, and now I can squash some stuff. <laughs> Three bits of squashed gold lets me make a wrench, which is apparently quite an important thing. But for engineer's goggles, I'm going to need some string, and I don't have any of that right now. But I can still make a few other things, like a millstone and a mechanical drill. One of my favourite things, though, is the mechanical saw, because that lets me chop down an entire tree just by sawing away at the bottom block. I've spotted a spider over there, and I really need the string. Let's see if we can get some. There it is, but there's a skeleton with it. Wait a minute, the skeleton just shot the spider. And there's an orca swimming around here. I really don't want to hit that by mistake. Well, that's my first skeleton of the series dispatched, but I think that spider is long gone. I'm still worried about that orca. So it turns out that as long as I don't hurt the orcas, the orcas won't hurt me. And by swimming with them, I can get the orcas might effect, which gives me increased attack speed. So that must be what I just had. Oh no, here comes another phantom. I wish I had a bed. Well, the only way I'm going to be rid of those phantoms is to sleep through the night, and that means I need a bed, and for that I need wool. And I'm clearly not going to find any of that here, so I think it's time to go exploring again. I'm just going to keep heading west until I find a bigger landmass, or maybe a bigger island. Or maybe, since there seems to be nothing out here, I'll end up just turning around and going back again. Oh, hold on, this looks promising. This looks very promising. Look, there are pigs. There were pigs. And there are sheep! Okay, I think I might have enough wool now. Phew. Let's check out this portal. And as I don't have any birch back at base, I'm going to grab some now. And with the sun going down, I'm finally going to make something to sleep in. But that doesn't have to be a bed, because we can make a sleeping bag. The difference is that a sleeping bag won't reset your spawn when you lie in it. And the sleeping bag finally lets us tick off this base game quest. And speaking of quests, we can tick off these overworld mob quests that we've now achieved. But best of all, I can finally sleep. Oh look, horses. Don't do it! I could really do with some leather. Don't you do it! Okay, I'm gonna leave those guys alone and hope that I find some cows later on. Is that some rice over there? I think it is. Rice is really useful in some of the farmer's delight recipes, so I'm definitely grabbing some of that. And lobsters, they've gotta be a food source, right? And here's another shipwreck to raid. And here are the cows I was hoping to see. So that wasn't a huge land mass, the change in biome that I was kind of hoping for, but it was a really big island. And that means that while I'm being chased away from it by this seagull, I've got a decision to make. And that decision is very simply, do I stay here and carry on expanding this starter base? Or do I try and pack up all of my stuff and move over to the big island? Well, why don't you let me know what you think I should do in the comments? And while you're there, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe so that you don't miss the next thrilling episode. I will see you then. For now, I've got a bed to sleep in. Night night. Last episode, we spawned into a vast ocean. We settled on an island and started to expand it, explored some caves, built a house, completed lots of quests in our quest book, built some simple create mod machines, and explored a much bigger island that we found. All commentated in a very high-pitched voice to try and make things sound exciting. But we don't need gimmicks because we've got gear mechs. Gear mechs. Gear, gear. It's create mod, right? 
So we ended last episode with a bit of a dilemma about whether we should stay here or move over to the bigger island that we found which is over behind me quite a long way away. And I want to make that decision pretty quickly because in this episode I want to make a start on my storage. And once I've done that I don't want to have to move it again. So it's decision time and the decision is... We're going to stay here. But either way, for my storage, I'm going to need lots of wood. And I want to get a bit smarter about how I'm obtaining that wood. I'm going to need a bit more space for that though, because this island is a bit on the small side. Placing all those planks is taking absolutely ages and using up what wood I do have. So I've got a better idea. And to help me with that, I'm making an upgrade for my backpack. The tool swapper upgrade will let me put all of my tools in my backpack. And when I try to use the wrong tool on a block, it will swap to the right one. Another clever thing I'm going to make to help with my inventory is the toolbox. So with my upgraded backpack on my back and my toolbox in my hand, I'm heading down to the caves. And as I reach the bottom, I'm going to try and mine the floor with my sword and it will instantly turn into my pickaxe. Thanks to that backpack upgrade. I found my first zinc and that has completed a quest, but I've no idea what a zinc is for at this point. I guess it's something important if it's completing a quest. I've put some of the items I've been finding into my toolbox and what this lets me do is I can link some of those toolbox slots to my hotbar slots. And then when I'm mining, as long as I'm in range of the toolbox, the stuff I'm mining will go into the toolbox instead of into my inventory. So if you watch that deep slate slot in my hotbar as I mine more deep slate, you'll see that it flickers up to 33 and back down to 32 and that's the blocks going into the toolbox. And it always leaves me with 32 blocks in my hotbar. So if I was placing the deep slate instead of mining it, it would keep putting the blocks out of the toolbox and topping up my inventory. Pure genius. It's just a really useful quality of life thing, both for mining and for building. I love it. But anyway, having done a bit of mining, I found what I was looking for down there, and it's this stuff. Let's just grab another couple of buckets of it. If we take a look at the map, this is what the island looks like now. I've joined it up to one of the smaller islands and there's a few other little islands around that we could do the same to. A really cool feature of this map is it shows the mobs around us, so we can see this is an orca over here. And if I zoom out a bit, we can see some other features. So over here is the shipwreck that we found when we first spawned into the world. And what we can see really clearly is the island that we explored in the last episode. But it's pretty obvious that we didn't explore all of it because that northern bit is still blacked out. It's still unexplored. So just to be sure that I'm not missing out on anything, I want to get over there and have a look. I'm bored of placing lava, so let's put this in there. And a boating we will go. I think I can see land ahead. Oh now, hold on, is that a village? It is a village. Oh, I can't believe that. That's so close to my base. I wish I knew that was there earlier. The villages in this pack are fancy villages, which means you've got fancy houses and better loot. Sometimes there's a working windmill with a grindstone, so if you find a village early on, it's a great way to get ahead with some of those create components. Right, let's get in there and see what we can find. Back at base and down in the mines, I've managed to find some of the blue shiny things. Let's put a torch down so that you can see them. That's better, look at these beauties. And I needed to get those diamonds because I had a minor incident making a cobble generator. What I've got back here is a big cog attached to the water wheel and a little cog attached to that. Then it's big cog, little cog, big cog, little cog to get a small cog spinning nice and fast. 
That was hard to say. That little cog is going to have a drill attached to it and that's just behind that cobblestone you can see here. First though I'm going to make a bit of a mess underneath here to get a system in to take the cobblestone away and put it into the chest. I'm going to pop a shaft in here and that should hopefully hold the water back when we break the gravel. And now we can make our first ever conveyor belt. To power the conveyor belt I'm just going to bring the shaft along from the middle of the water wheel for now. And we're going to put a gearbox on the end here to take the power around the corner towards the belt. The problem now is it's going round the wrong way but a second gearbox solves that problem for us. We just link it up and now we have a fully functioning conveyor belt. We just need to shove a chest on the end of it and a funnel going into that chest. And now all I've got to do is put the drill back on and we have a fully functioning automatic infinite cobble generator. Or at least we will do when I reconnect this cog that you didn't see me nick earlier. There we are, that's a beautiful thing. Except maybe it's breaking the cobblestone a little bit too fast for the belt to take it away. So I think we need to look at speeding that belt up a bit. So instead of it being connected directly to the water wheel, I've put a few more cogs in to connect it up to some of the faster moving bits. And hopefully that will do the trick. With that cobble farm done, I'm now going to start work on my tree farm. And this is quite a common technique in Create apparently, where we place a water wheel horizontally to give us a vertical spinning shaft. But I want mine spinning the other way, so I'm just going to put the water in the opposite corner. Our plonk has temporary solid block there and a mechanical bearing, but that's where I'm going to stop telling you what I'm doing. Because the tree farm I'm making is actually based on the design for a crop farm, and a step-by-step -step tutorial for that farm can be found in a video by Bruno Danoy, and I'm linking the to that in the description of this video, so if you want to find it, go and pop down to the description and see it for yourself there. So cutting to the finished product, here it is, my tree farm. You can see there's an arm with a bunch of saws on it that's going round and cutting away the trees. When it chops a tree, it collects all the goodies and puts them into the storage down there. The only thing this farm doesn't do is replace the saplings after it, so I'm going to have to do that manually for a little while. But I do have a plan for doing that, and we'll probably do that in the next episode. Mainly because that involves making one of these things a deployer, and it's made of some strange stuff that like I don't think I'm quite ready to make yet. But now that I've got an infinite source of wood, I can get back to making my storage, and believe it or not, that involves coming back down here to the mine. And that's because as well as all the wood in the world, I'm going to need some nether quartz to make a draw controller. And there's one place I know I can get nether quartz from. I mean, the clue's in the name, right? So let's light this thing and go through and see what we can find on the other side. Here we are, and it looks like we've got a solid wall of basalt there, and a massive drop into the basalt delta on that side. Wonderful, what a great spawn. Let's try and place a block to stand safely on. That's better. For a moment there, I thought I was never going to get out of that portal. I'm going to mine my way around behind a portal to try and make a safe place to stand on on that side. And to keep me safe, I'm going to block up this side. I don't think I'm going to find much in the way of nether quartz on the surface of a basalt delta, so I'm mining a staircase down underneath it, hoping to find something down there. And at last I've found some. We're going to need some quartz to make some comparators, and we need two comparators for our draw controller. And here's my draw controller in the middle of the floor and I've already put some sets of drawers in as you can see in the top left of your picture. But I want to mirror that on the other side and that means this is where I need to place my block. I'm going for 5x5 five five sets of drawers and putting three of those together to make little alcoves. And I've got three of those alcoves on each side. We just need to make sure both sides are linked up to the draw controller and we do that by using these trims. And we use some more of the trims on the outside to make sure we're linking the corners together and linking the sections together too. I want to enclose this storage in some kind of building. And for that to look good, I think we're going to need to make use of some of the fancy blocks that we can use with the workbenches. So in the workbenches bit of the quest system, we can see there's several different workbenches we can use for wood and stone and various other things. So let's make a couple of those and see what we can do with them. Here's the mason table, which is kind of the stone workbench. I'm just going to pop it up here for now out of the way. And if I grab a stack of tuff out of the storage, let's see what we can do with it. Wow, well, there's all sorts. Look at all this stuff. Glad tough, simple tough pillar. And look at how much I can scroll down. There's absolutely loads of it. Well, while I'm here, let's see what I can make with stone. Lots. I can make lots of things with stone. Wow, this is a builder's dream. I mean, together with the framed blocks, you could make just about anything with this stuff. If only I was a decent builder.
Well, I don't think this is a sensible long-term place for my mason table, so I'm going to move it. And I think it should live here in the stone section of my storage. And now I'm going to make a woodworking table or a carpenter's table. And I wonder if we can make as many things with wood as we can with stone. This can live here in my wood section. And let's see what it can do with these birch logs. Oh, okay, so there's a bit of variation in here, but not as many varieties as there are for the stone. Interesting. Well, I'm going to play with these new toys and let's see what I can come up with. So that's my storage done. I felt these walls were a little bit plain either side of the entrances, so we've got a little kind of motif thing going on there. And the roof, it's not quite what I imagined, but I quite like it. You can get some really odd shapes of these framed blocks, and yeah, I quite like that. It's kind of quirky. It's kind of me. In particular, I like the pattern that we've got here on the roof from the carpenter's table. Unfortunately, we couldn't get these blocks, these uh, slabs, to lay the same way as the others, but you can't see that from down here. No one needs to know. I probably shouldn't have told you about it, to be honest. And going inside, we've got all of our storage on both sides. So this is mainly for stone and stone related things. Some of this stuff over here I'll probably be moving to a different section. And the next section along is for wood. And again, we've got another couple of bits in here, which I'll be moving out in due course. But this is mainly for wood. Then this one, I've mainly got being food in here and we've got some mob drops over there as well and various other bits, but there's so much stuff you can get with Farmer's Delight. I'm really uh, sure that we're going to need a lot more space for that as well. So we've got all the spaces over here that I haven't put anything in yet, but I expect this middle one will be where I put all the create blocks, my redstone and that kind of thing as well. All the kind of technical stuff will go in here. In each of these 5x5 five five walls, there are 100 of these individual drawers. So we've got plenty of space. Hopefully it's going to be enough. And if not, well, we could extend upwards. We can extend downwards. We'll find a way. Well, that's almost it for this episode. But before I go, I just want to take you back over here to where we made our cobble maker because I've put another couple of things in over here too and I didn't really explain why we wanted a cobble maker in the first place so if I get a bunch of cobblestone out of there what I can do is I can chuck it in this chest up here you can see we've already got a load and that will go through here into our millstone and that turns it into gravel and I can turn the uh, gravel then into useful things by putting it into this washer here takes a little while but that will turn it into flint 
and into iron nuggets. So far from being just a plain cobble generator, this is actually sort of an iron farm. Let's just grab those from there. There we are, 13 iron nuggets from one stack of cobblestone. But as you've seen, I am manually taking a cobble from over there to over here and then manually taking the gravel from over there to over there. And all of this is a bit of a mess. It needs tidying up. I'm sure there's a better way of doing it. And uh, that's what I'm going to try and do for next episode. I hope you'll join me then. See you then. Bye. Last time we cobbled together this stone generator, made a tree farm, and built ourselves a storage warehouse to keep everything in. And this time I want to make everything function better, look better, and also I want to sort out my food source, because I don't really have one. The other thing I'd like to try and sort out today is the fact I've only got three types of wood to my name, and I want more. So buckle in, prepare for some derps, and let's play some Create Mod. I don't normally do a title screen for my videos, but I needed one to fit with the end of the music there. Anyway, I just want to get rid of some of these planks that we placed last time and replace them with something that looks a little bit better. While this clay and sand is uncovered, I'm going to grab a bit of it because I don't have much of that. Now I've replaced those planks with dirt and this is my cunning plan for what to do with the stone. I'm going to use this moss block that I found in the shipwreck, apply a bit of bone meal and it looks a lot better. And in order to get myself some more bone meal, I'm just going to use the standard composter setup that we'd do in in ordinary vanilla Minecraft. And what am I going to compost? Well, I've got way more saplings here than I'm ever going to need, and the tree farm's going to keep producing more anyway, so let's compost some spare ones of these. But that's enough vanilla mechanics for now. We're playing a Create Mod series, and that means we need to do some Create Mod stuff, and we've got some quests to complete. So first I'm going to make a clipboard, and we'll find out what that's useful for later in the series. Well, I hope we will. You can probably hear that it's pouring with rain outside, so while I'm safely indoors, I'm going to complete this quest. And here we go then, goggles acquired, and these things are pretty useful, because when I'm wearing these, I can look at Create Components and see how much power they are using. So if I come out here and look at my millstone, I can see that is using 128 stress units of power. And my water wheel over here is producing 512 stress units of power. And let's complete some more create quests, shall we? I want some oak logs, a bit of redstone, and one of these things. And together that means I can create a cart assembler. And that means we've very nearly finished with this section of the quest book. To complete it, I just need to make some windmill sails, which I can do now that I've got some wool. And that means we can start to look at this section of the quest book. And this is where the deployer is. You might remember we talked about the deployer last time. We're going to use it to automate our tree farm a bit more and plant the saplings behind it. But it looks like the key to this bit of the quest book is this mechanical mixer and basin, for which I need to craft a whisk, apparently. That's going to use up quite a bit of iron, but I think we can do it. And with the mixer and basin in place, the next thing I need to make is a blaze burner. Before I do that though, I want to sort this mess of a machine out and see if I can automate the production of these iron nuggets. So let's break this large cog to stop the machine. And now I can rip it all apart before we put it all back together again. And a couple of hours later, this is what the new version looks like. You can see we've replaced a deep slate in the cobble generator with glass so we can see what's going on. The cobble is now fed straight into the millstone where we grind it into gravel. And the gravel is fed along that conveyor belt you can see there where the fan washes it. And that turns it into flint and iron nuggets. And from this angle you can see how we've put the cogs and belts together to power it and get the timing just right. And after leaving that running for a while I've finally got enough iron. So let's pop over here to my crafting table and turn that into ingots. And then we want to flatten those. And then we can finally make our blaze burners. But that's only half of the quest completed because what we've made is an empty blaze burner and we need to make an actual blaze burner. But I don't feel anywhere near ready enough to go to the nether and tackle some blazes so I'm going to do a bit more exploring. Back at 
base where it's pouring with rain again and I've realised there's something I can do with all that flint that my machine is producing. And to begin with, that involves borrowing my mechanical press from in here and I'm going to plonk it down out here. But I don't think I want it quite there, I'm going to move it around the corner nearer my outfit. I think this is going to be a better place for it and I can link it up to this gearbox right here. Next I need a bucket of lava and I'm just going to grab this bit that I was using to expand the island with. So I'll chuck that in and then I'll just grab some gravel and some flint from this chest. And we throw those into that basin as well. Although it does help if you actually get it into the basin. And that should set the mechanical press going. It's a little bit slow and we might sort that out later on. But we get an advancement and what we also get is some andesite. Now to make this sustainable I'm going to want an infinite lava source and for that I'm going to need some dripstone. I don't have any of that yet so let's go looking for some. Well I didn't find any pointed dripstone but I did find some dripstone blocks next to this stuff, Oakram, which looks quite nice so I'm going to grab as much as I can. But as there don't seem to be any dripstone caves underneath my island I'm going to go back to the other islands I've explored and sometimes you can see dripstone caves from the surface so I'm going to have a quick look around and see if I can see any. And the answer was no I didn't see any but I did manage to find a tiger biome which means we've now got some spruce saplings. So if nothing else we've managed to get two more wood types in this episode episode. Well as I can't seem to find any dripstone maybe I should get back to that blaze burner quest we were working on. And the advantage of having the map and a fairly high render distance means I can have a good look around without actually having a good look around. And that dark patch on the map to the south of me looks like it could be a nether fortress. Let's have a look and zoom in. Yeah that's a fortress all right so at least now I know where we need to go. And basically it's off in that direction, but I don't fancy making my way across the surface, so I'm going to head down the stairs, turn right and start digging a tunnel. And I found my first bit of ancient debris, nice. Well I didn't get very far of that tunnel because I ran into a massive pocket of lava, but that's given me an idea. And that starts with this branch of the quest book where we need to make copper casing, and I think we can make that. All we've got to do is strip the beautiful texture off of these birch logs. And then click on them with these copper ingots. And there we are, we've created copper casing and entered the copper age. And that means we can now make ourselves a fluid tank. And eventually we'll be able to make ourselves a steam engine, a bit like this. But we're not quite ready for that yet. But what we are ready for is this. There's my fluid tank with a whole load of lava that I got from the nether. And that gets pumped into our basin here so I don't have to keep filling it up manually. And on the other end we've got a drain that we can pour our buckets of lava into when we've gone to get them. Now this is all very well and good, but it's a very small scale thing, isn't it? After all, it's only breaking one block of cobble at a time and it's doing it pretty slowly. The other thing is, I know there's a lot more we can get out of a cobble generator. Oh great, here comes the rain. But anyway, as I was saying before I was rudely interrupted by the weather, there's a lot more we can get out of a cobble generator than just iron nuggets, flint and gravel. So part of my plan for this episode was to decorate this thing and make it all look nice, but actually I'm now thinking this is all just a temporary solution to get some of the resources I need to make a much bigger and better version. But before I get on to that, I want to do something that I did plan to do in this episode, and that's to sort out my food supply. And there we are, so it's the same design as the tree farm, it's essentially Bruno Danoy's crop farm, as per his tutorial. I've got a mixture of crops in there, mainly potatoes and carrots, but a few other bits and pieces as well, just to give us a bit of a variety. And it's already producing. And I guess that means we could get rid of our manual crop farm over here, but I quite like the look of it to be honest, so I might just keep it for aesthetic purposes. But certainly both of these farms could look a little bit better, so let's see what we can do about that shall we? And I think that's looking a lot better, so for our vegetable farm over here we've been stacking up the vegetables into these crates, and essentially that's what I've got as decoration all the way around. 
with a couple of pumpkins chucked in and some overgrown spruce blocks that's these green leafy bits and for the tree farm i've just covered it in spruce but enough procrastination we really have got to do something about those blaze burners and i figure if i can't get to that fortress via the nether because all that lava's in the way then i can go the long way round and get there via the overworld by building a portal in just the right place so i've looked at my map in the nether and i've worked out what the coordinates are and that's why i'm scrolling through this map of the overworld to work out where i need to put my portal and the answer is going to be somewhere in this region here and i'm really intrigued to see what this round lump of tuff is it looks really odd well the answer to that question is that the round circle of tuff is just a round circle of tuff and i've decided i'm going to go and build my nether portal in that village so i'm away from all these pesky seagulls oh it looks like we've got an iron golem coming to visit want to come with me to the nether sir of course you do come on Oh, okay then, maybe not. How are you not going through the portal? I don't understand. Never mind. Okay, we're in the nether. That echo makes this place sound even more scary than usual. And I'm not wearing any gold, so those guys are gonna hate me. Whoa, on this side of the portal doesn't look very plod friendly. I don't want to be falling down there. I'm going to box the portal in so at least it's a little bit safer for the next time I spawn in. And then I'm going to go and find some gold armor so that I can at least walk past a piglin safely. I don't want to be dying to a piglin today. Okay, well listen, don't tell us what's going to happen though, because I like to be surprised. <laughs> okay, let's go back in. Oh, is that what I think it is? Yep, yep it is. The Iron Golem has made it through. Now I'm wearing a gold helmet, so I should be relatively piglin proof. And I think the nether fortress should be roughly in this direction. Well, I thought it would be over here somewhere, but this is just a big empty space that seems to go into a soul sand valley. Let's turn back. Oh, oh, wait a minute. What's that? Yep, that's definitely a bit of fortress, but I don't want to jump down to that because I won't have a way back up. But now that I know it's not too far away, I'm going to head back to the portal and dig down to it from there. There we are, nearly there. What? Ow! What was that? Well, I've no idea what that was, so I'm going to have a sneaky look at the map to try and work it out. There's a ghast over there, and... Wait a minute, what was that? A drop bear? What on earth is a drop bear? Well, let's see if I can get a look at it. certainly doesn't sound pleasant, does it? I think it's over in that direction somewhere. I can't see anything, though. Ouch! Run away! Okay, it's really close to me now, but it seems to be moving away a little bit. If it's watching the other door, I'm going to try sneaking out of this one. Oh, okay, there's something hiding right by that corner. Did you see it? Well, whatever it is, it doesn't seem friendly, so I'm going to give it a tap with my sword. Oh, and I completed a quest. I wonder if it's called a drop bear because it drops really good things. Oh, apparently not. Okay, I've mined down to the nether fortress and if I break in, hopefully we'll be able to find a blaze. Well, look at that. As soon as I said the word, there's one right there. Right, I've got my empty blaze burner and I think I just right click on the blaze with it and that should be what I need. Oh, well that didn't work. Let's try again. Ouch, it got me, but I got it. That's the main thing. Quest completed. But we've still got another blaze burner, so let's see if we can get another blaze.
case you didn't figure it out, I was trying to line up the crossbow piglin with the sword piglin so that it would fight each other and it didn't quite work out. But what did work out is that I could complete the blaze burner quest while I was at my home base and that meant I got another blaze burner to put in storage so no matter what I've got one. But retrieving the one I made from my corpse shouldn't be too much of an issue and that's what I'm doing right now. I really do like the corpse mod, it really does make dying just that little bit less painful. Here we are, this is the guy that killed me, and there's my corpse. Just in case he thinks my corpse is a kind of chest, I'm going to block him in before I get my stuff out of it. And here we are, let's transfer all that stuff back to my inventory. And with the blaze burner quest completed, the next thing we need to make are some brass ingots. And that involves using our blaze burner to mix some copper and some zinc. I knew we'd find a use for it, so we'll pop a blaze burner down here and a mixing bowl on top of it. Then we just attach the whisk thing on top of that. Then with a water wheel and a bunch of cogs, we've managed to get that turning. So I can chuck some fuel into the blaze burner and then throw my copper and zinc into the bowl and then absolutely nothing happens. It's fine, it just turns out that I needed to speed everything up and now it's all working, look at that. So I just need to get the brass out of the mixer and there's the quest and the advancement. Lovely jubbly. And now that I've made brass, there's lots of brass things that I can go on and make. Starting with rose quartz, which actually isn't brass at all. And we polish that with some sandpaper to get the imaginatively named polished rose quartz. And with that done and the brass quest done, we can finally move on to the moment we've been waiting for all the way through this episode and that's making a deployer. First, we need to make a brass hand by squashing some brass into sheets. Then I need an electron tube made from a flat iron sheet and our polished rose thingamajig. And putting it all together, we get our deployer. We knew you could do it! Back at the tree farm, I want to stick a load of deployers onto this side. This is to plant the saplings as it goes around. Ouch. Just need to stick it all together with some super glue. And then I want to filter the deployers to make sure they're placing saplings and not blocks. And just to check it works, if I put a bunch of saplings in the chest here, then we should see them all being planted. Just like that. So, having sorted out our cobble generator a bit, we've now got an infinite food farm and we've got a fully automatic tree farm. I might have mentioned something about making everything look better, but I'm going to leave that for another episode. Instead, having got into the copper and brass branches of the Create Mod Quest book, we are really close to finishing off that whole thing. So let's see if we can do that, shall we? It turns out I missed one quest. That's done it. We've completed an entire page of the quest book and that means we are ready to scale things up. That's what we're going to be doing next episode and I'm looking forward to it already. I hope you are too. See you then. Bye. Last time we made a vegetable farm and we got our tree farm planting its own saplings. We also completed all of the quests in the Create Basics chapter of the quest book. We also automated our iron production even though it's still really slow, thoroughly checked that the corpse mod is working, you know, just for science, and I suggested that I might update my cobble generator into something much bigger and better in this episode. So in this episode we completely failed to do pretty much anything with our cobble generator and instead we make a tunnel 
boring machine. And we start building our underground railway network, including our very own tube station, complete with working lift, actual railway tracks, and of course a tube train to go on them. I'm Plod Plod, and this is Mr. Beardstone's Perfect World Mod Pack. Okay, I said I wasn't going to do a title screen, but you know, never mind, I've done it now. One item that I'm going to need that isn't covered in the quest book is this thing called the mechanical plough. And I think I either have or can obtain all the ingredients I need to make it. I just need to flatten some of this iron, then just grab the recipe from the crafting book, and there we have it. I also want to make something called a schematic cannon. We're not actually going to use that in this episode, but you know, it's a cannon. Why wouldn't I want to own one? To go with that, we are going to need a schematic table. Basically, schematics are a way of transferring builds from one world to another, provided you've got enough materials. And we're definitely going to be exploring them a little bit more later on in the series. Today, though, I'm building my first minecart contraption, and I'm just adding some drills to the front of it, because this is going to be our first tunnel boring machine. Minecart contraptions are great because not only can they move along and mine out tunnels and things like that, but they don't need any power so you don't need like water wheels and things like that to be attached to them for them to work. Just behind those drills I've got these two deployers here that are going to place down blocks if there aren't any and then place down rails on top of those blocks. And here at the back of the build we've got our mechanical plough that you just saw me make and that's going to scoop up the rails and put them back in the contraption's storage. Speaking of which, it doesn't actually have any storage yet. Let's go and get some chests and add them to the machine. Now you might have spotted that I've got ordinary rails under my minecart contraption and that's because I'm going to use a furnace minecart and a furnace minecart will keep going along so it doesn't need powered rails as long as it's got fuel it will move itself along. And the best source of fuel I've got at the moment is wooden slabs, that's the most efficient way of burning wood so I'm making a whole bunch of spruce slabs that I'm going to use to power my minecart contraption. And all I've got to do is chuck them into one of these chests, doesn't matter which one, it's all joined up. The other thing I need to make sure it's got is some cobblestone so it can lay down some blocks in front of it to put the rails on. And we're nearly ready, all I've got to do now is grab myself a lever and then some super glue to stick it all together with. So starting at the front I'm just going to select this drill here and then see if I can get all of the drills in one selection. I can't because of the shape of it. That's okay, we can join the different selections together, as long as they overlap it will all combine into one contraption. Another rule is that all the blocks within your selection have to be connected to each other, so if you've got a funny shaped contraption like I've kind of got here, then you do have to do it in different sections just in order to combine it all together. And that's all good, it's all fine. It does mean that occasionally you end up leaving some blocks behind accidentally and I'm sure I will be doing that later on. Right now though I think we're ready for our first test so I've got my furnace minecart and let's see if this machine moves shall we? I just need to pop my lever down and empower it. Well it's kind of moving but that's not quite what I had in mind. Now how do I stop this thing? Oh okay like that, that's easy enough. I think the reason I couldn't get it moving is I need to actually nudge the minecart itself. So that means a slight redesign so I can get in behind it to give it a nudge. We still want the mechanical plough at the back but we just need the connection that joins it to the rest of the contraption to be high enough that I can get underneath so that I can nudge that minecart. With that all done I think we're ready to give it another go. So it's powered up and I just need to get behind here and give it a nudge. Yay, that seems to be working. It's not exactly fast though, is it? Is it slowing down? It's got all that fuel to burn, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Maybe the furnace minecart doesn't like burning slabs, which is a bit of a shame, because if it will only burn coal, then, well, I don't have a lot of that. Now I should be able to pick the contraption up or bring it back to the start point. Uh, let's turn it off and see if that does anything. What if I remove the minecart? Will that do it? Did that go the way you thought it was going to go? Nope. Well, after a bit of poking around, I think I've got things a bit sorted, so I've come down to the caves to give it a proper tryout. And yes, the seals that I used to share the island with have decided that they're going to take up refuge all the way down here. I mean, they are safe from the whales down here, after all. Not entirely sure how they got down here, though. 
But anyway, I'm gonna place some rails down here. I've decided just to stick with the normal rails for now because I can keep pushing the machine along manually for a little bit. Then I just need to grab the cart assembler out of my inventory. And now I can place down the contraption itself. Then I just have to chuck the lever down here and power it. And we're ready to give the whole thing a nudge and set it off on its first proper journey. So it's drilling away at the front and it's laying down cobblestone and rail to make sure it's got somewhere to go along. That's pretty much working perfectly, we just need to figure out this self-propulsion bit of it. So I've added a deployer to deploy redstone torches and swap the rails for powered rails. Let's just borrow a redstone torch from here to switch it on. And that deployer at the front seems to work okay. And at the back of course we've added another mechanical plow to scoop up those torches. So now let's get in behind the minecart and give the thing a shove and hopefully it should be on its merry way. Well it seems to be moving along pretty nicely. And now it's hit the wall so it's actually mining through the rock, that's why it's slowed down a bit. But it's doing its thing. We've made ourselves a fully automatic tunnel boring machine and I'm really pleased with that. A little while later and here's the end of my tunnel and I've stopped here because if you look in the map in the top right hand corner, you'll see that we've made it all the way to the big island. Now I was going to chuck in a montage of the machine digging all this tunnel out but frankly that would have been boring. Yeah, see what I did there? Hmm, boring. Okay. For now though, I've got a very long walk all the way back to base and hopefully it won't be a walk for too much longer because I want to build a better transport method down here. And I'm saying that as if it's some kind of mystery but you've seen the title of the video and the thumbnail and the opening bit where I told you what I'm going to do so you know exactly what I'm going to do along here. First though, I'm going to mine some of this stuff because it's here and why not? I'm also going to help myself to some of these and these and these. Mining contraptions don't have to mine horizontally though, we can make a vertical one as well, so that's what I'm doing over here. First I need to get some power in place though, so a few of these big water wheels ought to do the trick. And then the usual tricks with the big and small cogs in order to speed up that power to give us some decent rotation speed. And I'm connecting all of that to this rope pulley. What we also need connected is this gear shift and that lets me flick the lever and then the rope comes down and I can flick the lever again and it goes back up again. Magic! But we don't want to just connect a single block to it and watch it go up and down. We've got far more exciting things to be doing. Bring on the drills! There we go, a 4x4 square of them and I'm just going to glue them all together. And now let's watch this thing do its stuff. Well, I've let it go down a few blocks, but I've remembered I haven't put any storage on it, so I'm just going to bring it back. And now I'm just going to spam a few chests over the top of it and glue those on. And down it goes again. Well, after quite a bit of mining, it seems we've hit a waterlogged cave, so I'm going to pop down there and see if I can block some of that up. We've still got a fair bit of water down there to clear, though, and we know something that's quite good at clearing water. Uh-oh. I'm thinking we need to do something about the floor in this building because we've got the walls and the ceiling and the roof all sorted, but we never actually sorted the floor. I fancy some sort of wooden floor, so I'm looking in the carpenter's workbench to see what we can make. Well, I really like the idea of these herringbone tiles, but those edges are really pixelated, aren't they? Those diagonal bits, I don't think I like that. It's a little bit better from a distance, but I'm really not too sure. Well this one is a slight variation on the same theme but it's still got those pixelated diagonal edges and I'm, I'm really not keen on them. Going for a straighter design then and this one I quite like.
Okay, so back to our big vertical hole and having made it, I now want to cover it up. And that's because our drilling machine has now done its job and it's time to dismantle it. I'm gonna dump all the stuff in this input chest that I've added to the storage system. It just makes it a bit easier than having to go inside every time. And we want to turn our vertical shaft into a lift shaft. So the first thing I need to do is define this as the top floor. And to do that, I'm just giving myself a couple of blocks in the corner here, one over the shaft and one on the ground. And then I need to put in these redstone contacts facing each other. One goes there and the other one goes that way round. But hold on a second because I've put that exactly underneath where the pulley needs to attach to the lift and that might not be the best idea. But we'll figure that out later. For now down here at the cave level I'm going to put another redstone contact in the same place but obviously lower down. And by doing that, we've kind of defined two floors where we want our lift to be able to stop. But as the pulley hasn't connected to the block underneath it, I'm going to move these redstone contacts over to a different corner to see if that solves our problem. So I'm gonna put them in this corner instead, up here and down here. And if I put a button on there, we should be able to use that to cool the lift down to this floor. Back at the top, and I'm really getting fed up going up and down that ladder, we just need to add some contraption controls to this lift and then glue the whole thing together, and then hopefully it should stop working. So if I click on the pulley, it should add a rope that goes down and forms a lift. Maybe I need to click it on the side. Hmm, it's not working. And it turns out the reason it's not working is because I need to turn this rope pulley into an elevator pulley. And it turns out the rope pulley isn't even involved in the elevator pulley recipe. We just need an iron sheet, a kelp block and some brass casing. So we just plonk this on the end here where the rope pulley was. And nothing seems to be happening. I'll try clicking on it. Nope, maybe it's going the wrong way. Let's flick the lever and try again. Oh wait, it's facing the wrong way, it's not even connected. Well, <laughs> we can sort that out. So now we give it a click, and that's what we were looking for. So now we can see that we are on level one, and if I scroll on this, we should be able to get to level zero. Yep, there it is. And click, and down we go. Wow, this thing's pretty fast. Oh, I like the way it slows down at the end and stops with a satisfying thunk. So now we should be able to send the lift on its way back up again, all the way up there to the surface. We just switch the control back to level one and give it another click, and yes, off we go again. Now we can give this floor a name by clicking on the elevator contact. For now I'll call this the ground floor, and if I wander back over to our lift controls, we can see the name is over here now as well. So down at the cave level, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm not going to call this cave, I'm going to call this platform. And I'm actually going to rename my ground floor to surface. One more thing I want to test is that I can send the lift away and call it back again. So if I set the controls to go back up to the ground, but don't step on the lift, and then we'll see if we can call it back. I really don't want to fall down there. I am going to go down there though, because I want to make another floor all the way down at bedrock level. I've peeled in the bottom to make it level, so let's call the lift down here now, shall we, and see if this works. So we've got a mechanically working lift, but it doesn't really look like a lift. It needs some doors, it needs some walls around it, and it needs to be safe so that when it, the lift isn't here, I don't end up falling all the way down the lift shaft. There's a whole load of doors that are in this pack, but I want to find some that will look and work a bit like the sliding doors you'd normally see on a lift. Before I put any doors on though, I want to swap out this floor, and I've come up with a block that I want to use, but I can't seem to break the floor that's already there. Oh, this might help. Rookie error. Now I can break this floor out, and I'm gonna replace it with this weathered cobblestone, because that has the kind of dusty, weathered, nondescript look that lift floors tend to have. I mean, have you ever studied a lift floor? They're not that interesting. In fact, seeing those in place, I'm not really keen on them, so I'm gonna swap them out for sanded cobblestone instead, which does kind of the same job. 
These little doors I've settled with for now, I'm not really happy with them, but they're the only sliding doors really that I can obtain right now. And it's time to put the walls in as well. And I've got these sort of half blocks that we've got from the framed set. Well, I've swapped out the doors for these andesite ones because the others didn't seem to want to open and close with the lift. And as you can see, we've filled in those framed blocks. So let's take the lift for a spin and make sure the doors open when we get to the other floor. Here we are, we're just arriving now, and there you go. Well, it's quite a bit later now, and we're heading back down because I want to show you this. I've been pretty busy with the tunnel boring machines, and we're starting to make the shape of a railway platform and a railway, of course. We've just got a bit more deep slate to clear out, and then we'll be ready to start decorating. Here we are then, and the bit I'm standing on is obviously going to be the platform, and then we've got the track bed down here. And this tunnel goes all the way off to the west, to the island that we found over there. And if I scoot round this way, we've got the beginnings of a tunnel that goes off to the south, and we'll join up with the big land mass over there. Just want to replace some of this tuff on the track bed with deep slate, because tuff doesn't really look right there. And then we'll get on with the rest of the decoration. Having made a station, we now need to make a railway to go inside it. And to do that, we need to deploy some iron nuggets onto some stone slabs. And then they need to be squashed in order to be turned into proper railway, like this stuff. So now we just place our first bit of rail, click on it again, and we can expand it along as long as we've got the rail to expand it to. Having made the rail, we now need to make use of the crushing wheels that we made at the end of the last episode. They are going to need some power to work, so we're going to expand this water wheel here, so make sure we've got plenty of it. So that's my crushing wheel setup done, but I need to be able to put some items in the top of it. So I'm going to make a little platform so that I can get up there in order to do that. And what I need to crush in here here is some obsidian, so I'll just chuck it in the top and we'll see what happens. And we get some more obsidian out and some powdered obsidian, which is what we are going to need for the next thing we're going to make. So we're trying to make a train station which involves a train casing and a compass. For the train casing we need to deploy a sturdy sheet onto some brass casing. And for the sturdy sheet we need to spout some lava onto our powdered obsidian and then squish it a couple of times. Let's be honest, some of these recipes are really weird. But anyway, we've made our train station and we have some train casing and that means we can actually make a train to go on these tracks. So I click on the rails to create a train station and then put the actual item down somewhere. Then we should be able to click on that with our train casing to start our train. Except that doesn't seem to have worked. It turns out we have to put the station into build mode first. Now we can click with the casing. And this time we get our first bogeys. I've got a design for a train that I've been building in creative and thanks to the schematic table that we built earlier, we can introduce an outline of that train into this world. We could use a schematic cannon to actually build it for us, but that involves a lot of gunpowder, which I don't have much of at the moment. So for now, I'm using the outline to copy the design manually. And that's our train station and our train all done. And next time, we'll try and make the train move. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'll see you then. Bye-bye now. Yeah! 
last time we made this train in this station with this fully working lift to get up and down. We also used a tunnel boring machine to make some very long tunnels but not enough railway tracks to go all the way along them. So this time we want to extend the track that the train is on so that it goes a little bit further than well here. But first here I am in a combination of iron, gold and leather armour and that's not good enough is it? We need to get some diamond stuff and some decent enchants. And I want to see if the villagers are in a mood to help me do that. First of all I've chosen this house to be my trading hall and I'm just clearing out a bit of space to make room for it. So having done that I've got a nice clear space with a single workstation and I just need a villager to come along and connect to it and I shall trap them in for life. Of course I don't just want the one villager though, so I'm going to make some more workstations to try and attract and trap a few more. Many, many hours later and we've got our villagers in place and I've been very busy rolling their trades to get what we want. And let me introduce you to Bridget over here in the corner because she will trade me some mending books. I've also got a couple of fletchers over here in the corner and they will take my sticks and flint and turn them into emeralds for me, which is excellent. I've also got a couple of armourers in the trading hall but they only want to sell me shoes and trousers so I'm going to have to make my own jumper and hat. By which of course I mean chest plate and helmet. Now then I can get rid of my leather, gold and iron armour and cover myself in diamonds. We still need to get all of that enchanted though and some of these trades are pretty expensive so it's taking a little while. But a bit later I do have enough protection, mending and unbreaking books in order to enchant all four pieces of armour. I've just got to combine the books together and then get them onto the armour itself. My only issue with that though is I don't have enough experience to do it all. But we do have the experience nuggets that we got from our quests earlier and it looks like we can turn those into proper experience using a machine a bit like this. First I need to pop down a fluid tank then we need a pipe that connects to it and let's just make sure it's going the right way we want the liquid going into the fluid tank and that is going to pull liquid experience out of the disenchanter then we want another mechanical pump that pumps the liquid back out of the fluid tank so that i can collect it to power these i'm just going to put a cog on here and connect it to a crank handle i don't need it to be fully automatic i can just stand here and wind the thing myself so let's grab some XP nuggets and see if we can level ourselves up. I'll just drop these on here, they should go into the disenchanter and I turn the crank handle. Whoops, let's try again. Well this doesn't seem to be working, I keep picking up the experience nuggets again and I don't seem to be sucked into the disenchanter. But having pondered the disenchanter again, it looks like we need to feed items into it using a belt. So that's easy enough, we can just put another cog down here. And I'm just going to place a belt on that leads into the disenchanter. And now I use right click to place the experience nuggets onto the belt. Oh, and I've gained the experience. Is that all I needed to do? I don't need this machine at all. <laughs> yeah, alright, it's not that funny. Apparently then I can just grab some experience nuggets and chuck them against the floor, right clicking them, and yeah, we get some experience. So let's enchant my trousers. You can call them leggings if you have to. I don't have quite enough levels for the boots, but we can just go and grab some more. But that only gives me 13 levels and each of these pieces of equipment is going to need 16 levels for me to get the enchantment book on them. The boots only need 13 though, so that's them done. What am I going to do about getting more levels though? Well, I've got a plan and it involves this thing. You see, by creating a minecart contraption immediately underneath a spawner, we can move the spawner to wherever we want it to be. And you might remember that a few episodes ago, we found a zombie spawner right here in our caves below the base. So if I clear out a little bit of space underneath it, we should be able to place our minecart underneath and a minecart contraption maker jobby. And then we should be able to just swipe away that spawner. And that means we can place a whole bunch of spawners in the same place to make an overpowered mob farm. Here we go then, I just place a bit of track underneath the spawner down here. I'll chuck my minecart on top of it. And now if I grab the cart assembler we can- Oh no, bad things are happening. I'm stuck, I can't get out, and I really really don't want to have to break the spawner, that would be a disaster. But I'm suffocating. And truth be told, I'm adding this voiceover later and I know I could have just pressed shift and that would have been fine, but I didn't think of that, I was panicking. 
But no real harm done, we just need to go back and collect the goods from my corpse and then we can try again. Except, where is my corpse? I mean, I was in the minecart and my head was in the spawner, so has it got stuck inside the spawner? Is it going to start spawning corpses or something? That would be weird. Let me just grab this track and... I mean, let's have a look at the thing. It looks, it still looks like a zombie spawner to me. If my corpse was stuck in there, then the mini zombie inside would have turned into a mini plod corpse. I wonder if my corpse has gone down there underneath it. Well, I don't have any tools to dig down, so let's go and get some and we'll find out. After quickly making a pickaxe, yes, we're in luck. There's my corpse. Thank goodness for that. I really don't want to lose that armor so soon after making it. Let's try again then, and this time I'm going to make sure I put the cart assembler down before I put the minecart on the track. So let's put the minecart in then, and now I need something to power the assembler, like a lever. And I didn't bring anything, did I? Let me go and get something. I find it so difficult to remember everything I need to take with me when I'm doing this stuff. Anyway, lever in hand, let's do this. We switch it on, and now we just should be able to click on it with the wrench, and it should pop into our inventory, and the spawner should disappear. Just like that. Now I just need to make somewhere to put it. Let's do this. I'm planning to kill the zombies is with a deployer so they will come down the water streams and end up in this corner of the building here and if we stick a deployer on then we should be able to set it up so it will punch the zombies. For starters I just need to get it pointing the right way which apparently is easier said than done. Okay that's facing the right direction now and if I tap on it with the wrench we can turn it from use mode into attack mode. For it to work it is of course going to need some power so I'm going to put a water wheel and some cogs in over here to make it do its punching. Will you get out of the way please? To start with I've just put a big water wheel in and I'm attaching it to the deployer directly and that's very slow isn't it? But after a little bit of jiggery pokery we've managed to speed it right up so if we look at this water wheel we can see it produces 512 stress units and if we wander back over to the deployer we can see that it's using all 512 stress units so it is moving at maximum speed which is perfect. Before we get the zombie spawner in though, we just need to think about storage of the stuff it's going to produce and I am going to use some of these storage tanks for the first time. But you can't click on these the way you can with a chest or a barrel for example, but you can put stuff in and take stuff out using the other create component. So a setup like this will transfer the items from the deployer to the vault and now we're going to climb the wall and put the spawner in. This metal ladder by the way is just a normal ladder that you can convert using the carpenter's table. I've broken a hole in the wall, I'm just going to use these planks to make myself a little walkway to walk along to get the spawner into the middle. So I'm going to put the minecart contraption here and of course I need a space for a lever next to it. So there's my lever, there's my rail. Let's place a torch down to make sure the spawner doesn't activate. Now the moment of truth, here's the minecart contraption. Let's flick the lever. Oh and nothing's happened because I forgot to put the cart assembler down. One day I get something right first time, here we go. And now the minecart. And that looks a lot more promising. Now we can break the minecart and the spawner should stay put. And it does. So now we can just break all this stuff and take it back with us again. And now we just break the torch and let it start raining zombies. That's what we want to hear, the sound of a zombie being hit. And what we want to see, of course, is this, the experience nuggets coming out of the deployer and going into our storage. We're not done yet, because when I made the trading hall over in the village, I heard a lot of zombie sounds, and so I went to explore, and sure enough, I found another spawner right underneath there. So we've got a second zombie spawner that we can pick up and put into our mob farm. So if we just break these wooden planks down here, I've made a little staircase that leads down to the spawner. And let's see if I can collect this one without dying, shall we? So this should be simple enough, I just stick a torch on the existing spawner to stop the zombies and then we'll follow exactly the same process to put this spawner, we'll put it directly underneath the existing one. 
and we get it right this time so rail and then the minecart loadery thing a torch to keep us safe lever now the minecart contraption it's in the right place remove the minecart then get rid of the torch and now we've got twice the zombies spawning now i've remembered that belts don't use up any stress units at all so instead of this one having its own water wheel i've attached it to the other one and not only does that save me a water wheel but it means it's a lot faster now we've got all these gubbins going into our vault but i want to get the experience nuggets and only them out again and to do that i'm going to use a brass funnel because we can add a filter to that so with no filter it will just spit everything out in stacks but clicking here with a nugget applies the filter we want i'm going to add a chest here and connect it up with a belt then all the experience nuggets will go into that chest and i'll be able to pick them up whenever i want to just need to power this belt so i should just be able to grab the power from this gearbox and connect it up with a couple of cogs it's going to turn the wrong way though so we just want a second gearbox to make it go right then we just join it up and of course i've forgotten to put a funnel on the chest i'll use a brass one so that it can cope with full stacks of items now my challenge is to try and make this thing look a little bit neater and andesite casing is great at this it can cover over these shafts and the cogs just to box everything in and make it look just a little bit tidier there we are i think that's looking a lot tidier but around this side where the water wheels are i'm going to try and hide this mess of cogs by expending the building out a little bit shape of the building might be done but I've definitely got some other ideas about how we want to decorate it a bit further. First of all I'm just going to fill in the corners with a different colour just to give us a bit of texture variation and I might come back and give the roof a bit of shape in the future but for now I'm just going to slab over it to make sure it is spawn proof. Well that will do on the building for now let's see how many experience nuggets we've managed to obtain and that's what six and a bit stacks that's not bad I'm happy with that. The big question is is it enough to finish enchanting my armour? And the big answer is yes, yes it is. There we are in all four slots filled with diamond armor with unbreaking, mending and protection four. That's what I wanted. There's another couple of modifications I've wanted to make to the farm. So behind me, you can see I've put a trap door in so we can have a sneaky look at what's going on. And also I've got this chest here next to me. That's got a hopper underneath it. I've put some weapons in here. So you can see there's some axes and some swords. And they're going into the deployer here. At the moment I've set it up so it will take in the axes. And that will make sure the deployer is actually holding a weapon when it hits the zombies. And obviously that kills them that little bit faster. But talking of killing them faster, we did get a little bit of a backlog. So I wanted to speed things up even more. So what I've done is I've put a second water wheel on here. And if I wander through here, I put in a slightly different arrangement of cogs so that we can get the speed out of that second water wheel. So things are running about twice the speed as they were. But although I can see the end of the process there with the trapdoor, I think the building would look better and actually it'd be a bit more fun if I could see inside the rest of it. And in order to do that, I'm going to need tinted glass. And for tinted glass, I am of course going to need amethyst. Now, so far, I've only found one amethyst geode on my travels, and it's all the way at the other end of my tunnel. And my mining machine kind of sliced through it a little bit. But this ability to move spawners around the world has given me an idea. I want to go and try it out. Here I am at the geode then, and actually the tunnel mining machine hasn't cut too much of it off. I think you know what the idea is that I've got, so let's get in there and see if we can give it a try. I've cleared some space under one of the budding blocks, and here's my rail, cart assembler, and lever. Hopefully we'll be able to take this budding amethyst away with us. Let's chuck our minecart in, flick the lever, and see what happens. Well, that looks promising, it's turned into a minecart contraption. But if I try to pick it up with the wrench, it says a mystical force is binding it to the world. And that basically means we can't pick it up. Never mind though, we can still expose all of the budding amethyst blocks and harvest them the old fashioned way. The good thing is this geode is right underneath where I want to build in the future, so we'll definitely be spending some time loading it in this area. For now though, I'm going to head back to base with my measly portion of 16 amethyst shards. I did get quite a few amethyst blocks though, and I wonder if I chuck this in the crushing wheels, would I get some shards out? 
Yes, I do. Let's grab a whole stack of blocks and do the same thing again. So this gives me well over a stack of tinted glass. That should be plenty to make some windows with. With my tinted glass, I've put in some observation windows on every side. And they're slightly different on each one. We've got a little balcony on each side that uh, allows us to go up and have a little look in. So it's a little peep. There they all go. And the nice thing is with these windows, although they don't let any light in, so the spawners still work, it allows us to see better. This one I've kept a little bit more compact instead of having the ladder coming all the way out. Uh, we've got the staircase coming up alongside the building. It's just so satisfying. Not much on this side, just a low ground floor window so we can see the end of the uh, waterway down here. I didn't bother doing anything up there. I think there's enough kind of enough going on on this side of the building really. So I figured I didn't need too much more. I might put some plain black glass windows, not tinted glass, just in these bits where they're kind of machine houses. They don't need to be tinted glass because there's no zombies in there. In fact, we want it lit up inside. But it might just kind of add to the feel of the building a bit. But yeah, I'm kind of happy with that. The main thing is it's, it's working really, really well. But we're running out of time for this episode and there's loads I haven't done yet. I'd still like to do a little bit more to tidy this island up. There's still some stone there that we haven't turned into moss and I'd like to get some sand all the way around the edges of it just to make it look a bit more kind of complete. And we've got a really harsh corner down here to try and sort out. So yeah, I need to try and spruce the island up a little bit. Over here we've got our elevator that goes down to our underground station and I want to make this look like an underground station too, like the top of one. And of course we've got some more create bits and pieces here that we want to hide away and just tidy up a bit, make it look a bit better. All of this stuff is of course my cobble generator. I want to get rid of this completely and replace it with a better one. And that's why I want to get this tube train moving because I want to build my farms at the other end of this tunnel on the big island so that I've got a bit more space to play with. So lots lots more to do but at least I've got fully enchanted diamond armor in which to do it so hopefully I won't die quite as often. And that's quite an achievement. We've also got an infinite source of XP and well, rotten flesh if we want it. And also the other stuff that's gone into the vault. All the armor and other bits and pieces that zombies drop. We've got all of that stuff, as much of it as we want. So I reckon that's enough for this episode. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hello. Last time we made this zombie farm and geared ourselves up. But today we're running away from all of that because we've got a big job to do over in this direction. So here we are on the big island, our little island is off over that way somewhere and we are roughly in line with our train tunnel which obviously doesn't have any trains going along it just yet and that's because that's what we are here to sort out. First of all we need to make a shaft that goes down to where we want to go so I've started to rig up this drilling machine and this time I put some deployers on top of it as you can see they're set to chuck in a load of cobblestone that will line the tunnel walls as it goes down to make it go down of course we need to rig up a rope pulley and I'm going to power it using this large water wheel here so let me just sort that out get it up to a decent speed okay we're ready and in fact we've dug a tiny bit of a test hole just to make absolutely sure we are ready so let me flick that lever up there and then down it goes um is it stuck well, I don't know what's happened there because these deployers are supposed to deploy stuff a block away. So none of them should be placing blocks within this square, they should be placing blocks in this kind of position. This is supposed to be the easy bit. I'll figure it out somehow. Okay, so this time I've moved all the deployers all the way to the outside. I don't think that's right, but it clearly wasn't working with them on the inside, so I guess we'll give it a go. Yeah, that's going to place the blocks too far out. But I don't really know why it wasn't placing the blocks along this bit here, which is where we wanted them. At least it seems to be working now. Well, we got there in the end and actually we only came across one cave that I had to fill in. No lava, no water to worry about. Just like we did on our home island then, we can now get rid of the mining machine and replace it with an elevator. This might not look like much of a platform to you, but our railway should be about 15 blocks in this direction. I mean, I say railway, there's no railway there. It's just a tunnel at the moment, but hopefully it links up. Let's just dig through and see if we find it. 
Having made my way back home again, I now want to fill this chest behind me up with the things I'm going to need to build the farm that I'm going to build over there. And what I have here is a checklist of the things I'm going to need. And I'm gradually filling these up and checking these off. Oh, what I didn't show you just then was how I built that checklist in the first place. So actually you do that with the schematic cannon. So what you can do is you grab your clipboard, you pop it in here, and that will automatically populate your checklist. And if you've got your stuff in a chest next to the schematic cannon, like I have there, then on the checklist it actually ticks off the things you've got. So if I take that lever out of the chest, and we pop our clipboard back through, and now have a look at it, you'll see we now need a lever. It's ticked everything else off, but still saying we need a lever. And if I pop the lever back in the chest, pop the schematic cannon clipboardy thing back through, and look at it, now it ticks it off. And just like that we have a building, and this is Batsy's cobble generator. I've added in a vault for storage, so let's switch it on and see what it does. Well, after running for not very long at all, it's already produced over 10 stacks of cobble, so I think this is going to do pretty well for us. And although it's not the worst looking thing in the world, I still want to build a building around it. So let's get on with that. That's enough. Oh, sorry, Scotty. I thought you liked my montages. Anyway, behind me is the end result. I've mainly used the rounded cobblestone bricks for the walls and then I varied a bit with some of the other cobblestone varieties. For the windows, it's mainly the spruce bark variety of trapdoors that you can see behind me. And we've got some of the strip spruce varieties as well. And I've made the building high enough that we can put another cobble generator on top should we wish to double up. I'm not entirely convinced by the roof, but I'm very happy with the rest of the build. Before I do anything, with the cobble generator though I want to put a building around the lift mechanism that we've got behind me here so let's do that shall we first of all I've got rid of that assembly of cogs that we had here and replaced it all with a rotational speed controller that's this thing here and that means that we can get this thing running nice and quickly without all of those cogs and also it's a lot quieter for the lift itself i've kept it very simple i've just used stripped cherry logs and some cherry trap doors and i've left the floor as it was with just plain old cobblestone and for the outside of the building i'm just using the same lock pallet as we used for the building over there so it will be an unstripped spruce frame with cobblestone variants on the walls and actually i've realized i need to bring these out a little bit further and with the spruce framework in its proper place and the walls and roof all done, it looks like this. Not a bad little building for say so myself. I've used the massive cobble bricks for this building. I kind of like the idea of using the biggest bricks for the smallest building. And I don't think it needs a lot more in terms of texturing, so I'm going to leave it as is, because I think otherwise it can start looking a little bit too fussy. One interesting thing I've discovered though is, if I make my way into the lift and head on down to the platform, take a bit of damage every time. Maybe it's Minecraft's way of punishing me for making this interior quite so garishly pink. But anyway, there's no point having a lift that goes down to the platform if there's no train to arrive at the platform. And my plan is to automate the production of that over here, but first I want to test the theory and that means going back to our starter island to make some railway over there. So we're back here and I've already been a little bit busy, let me show you. I've turned most of the remaining stone into moss and I've put sand all the way around the edge of the island just to give it a decent perimeter make it look like a beach and make it just look a little bit more natural so it's looking a lot more complete now as an island instead of the mess that it was before and the other bit of tidying up I want to do is to get rid of some of the temporary machines and farms that I've made like this one here that actually I don't need right now okay so now that I've cleared up my mess I can start making a new one and the first thing I'm gonna do is put a speed controller right here and speed controllers always have to be connected to a large cog wheel so there's one of those so to make our railway track we need to start with some slabs and then deploy a nugget a couple of times and then press it so that's what we're going to do so i'm going to put a chest down for our slabs here in fact let's make it a double one 
And then we've got a couple of belts to go in. So we've got one going from here all the way to here. And then one from there. Oh, I need to put the shaft in, that would help. And then we've got another chest at the end to collect the goodies. Let's put a couple of funnels on each of those. So now we're going to want our two deployers, one there and one there. Might be facing the wrong way, but let's not worry. And then we want our stampy thing on the end here. Oh, but that's right on top of the funnel, so I think we're going to need to move everything back another block. There we are, that's looking better. And then we need to feed the nuggets to the deployers. So a shaft on top of each of them. With a double chest on top of that, should do the job. That's not a double chest. That's more like it. So in theory, if I tell the deployers to only use iron nuggets, and we chuck a load of them in here, and I chuck a load of slabs in this chest, oh, which I can't because I've placed a block on top, there we go. We should get rails coming out of the end. That doesn't seem to be doing anything. Oh, we haven't powered these at all, have we? That's not going to work. So a few shafts out of the back, and then we need to attach it to that cog over there and bring it all together with a belt. And that has overstressed the whole system, but that's okay because we can just slow it down using our speed controller. That seems to be working quite nicely. Well, well, that worked pretty nicely and that's produced a little bit of rail for me and I've now used up all of my iron. So we really need to scale this up and that means going back to the big scale farm place. So I've spent a little while with my mining machine and by the way, I've put silk touch on this pickaxe. So I've got a fair few ore blocks and instead of fortuning them, I'm going to put those ore blocks through these crushing wheels behind me because that also gives us multiple ores. So opening the chest up here, we can see we've got a load of stuff in here and I've got a load of iron ore in my inventory too. So the next thing I want to do with this little machine is to extend it so that it will automatically smelt or blast, I should say those ores into the nuggets that we need. So just to recap, we can put our items in here and they will go up this belt and into the crushing wheels. From there, they go along to here and into that chest. And if I scoot underneath, they can then come out of this chest and along there and we'll pop some lava in, in that gap there and the fan will blast whatever items come out of there. So the blasted items go into the chest at the end there. What we need to do is make sure that only the blastable items come out of this and to do that we're going to use a filter and if you're wondering what the advantage of this is over putting this stuff through a furnace and smelting it in the ordinary way it's quite simply that this won't use up any fuel now the thing is this will come out in stacks because it's a brass funnel and the only question is will that be enough to blast it let's try it shall we see what happens yeah it's not getting blasted is it okay so we've got a little bit of rethinking to do we're nearly there okay so i've created another couple of water wheels so we can speed this whole thing up so that should blast down a bit further the other thing i've done is i've separated this belt from that one and we're going to give this one its own power source just like that i probably could use a small uh, water wheel instead of a big one but that's okay it's gonna do the trick as you can see that belt is now moving really slowly as you can see that has now come out and is getting very slowly blasted hopefully that will turn into proper copper by the time it reaches that funnel yeah there it goes there's our copper ingots excellent so this was only going to be a temporary setup but i've decided i actually want to keep it and you know what that means And there we are. I've made sure that the chests are all still accessible. You can see all three of them there. 
And, well, that's pretty much done. It's a bit of a shame that we've hidden away all the movement, so I might come back and try and add a bit of animation to the building in the future, but for now, I'm pretty pleased with what we've got. But anyway, the reason we went down this entire rabbit hole was because I ran out of iron. And now... I haven't run out of iron anymore. The reason I want that iron is I want to make another item vault so we can take stuff out of that one. You can see through the windows there. That's going to be full of cobblestone. We want to take that into a separate vault, which is going to be the input vault for our gravel farm. And then we're going to wash that gravel to turn it into more iron. To make our vault we need barrels and iron sheets so i'm gonna build the gravel iron farm thing over on this side of the building and i'm gonna start off with a vault i'm gonna put it in the same height as that one over there i'm gonna put some shoots on the bottom of this to take the cobblestone out they are going to feed directly into our millstones underneath those i'm gonna put some andesite funnels i just need to dig down to do that we're going to put some belts underneath here coming out from both sides so let's get the shafts in for those so we're going to have five belts coming out on this side and five belts coming out on this side and that is where the gravel is going to be washed to wash the gravel we need to put some fans in and then they're going to have water in front i've made it water sources all the way across just because flowing water sometimes causes a little bit of lag and the less lag we have the better for the item collection I'm going to put a vault all the way along this side and I'm going to bring it out an extra block and we're going to put a conveyor belt that goes in all the way from the other side over to here so that all the items come into the one place. And the other belt we need to put in is of course the one that's actually going to take the cobble into the farm in the first place. With all the components in place and the weather not being very helpful it's time to power this thing up so we're going to need some cogs to power these uh, millstones. We also need to power these fans and I was hoping to be able to do that by putting a shaft into the back of them through these funnels here, but it doesn't look like we can. So we might need to do a bit of rethinking. So after a bit of jiggery pokery, we've managed to get it working. Well, kind of working. We've got another problem now and that's the same problem we had before actually over with the lava where when we get the farm going we get the cobble coming in it goes through the chutes but it goes so quickly along the belts that it doesn't have time to get washed so we're going to have to slow these belts down in order to make sure the gravel gets washed into flint and iron nuggets so the two things i want moving quickly are this belt which powers the fans and this shaft here which powers the millstones so i just need to connect those up to together and to that large cog over there and then we can control the speed of that and then what i'm going to do is just use the slow rotation of the water wheels themselves that comes out of that end of the speed controller and we'll link that up to the belts so this should be fairly straightforward so a fair bit later and we've got it working now we've had to slow the speed all the way down to 32 because any stronger than that and the fans would actually blow the cobblestone along instead of washing it it would just get blown along to the end of the belt so we had to slow it down to 32 just to actually make sure it's got time to be washed on these belts in case you're wondering the noise you can hear is the cobblestone generator working away in the background so this is all working on this side i just haven't set it up on the other side so we need to do that now and now we're all done on this side too because of the angles we couldn't use shoots the same way we did on the other side so I've used belts instead and as you can see that's going into these barrels and then all the way down and being crushed in exactly the same way and washed. Overall it might not be the prettiest of things but it's certainly working and as you can see it's churning out the iron nuggets and the flint on both sides. It's all coming around into our storage vault at the end here. Let's see how much we've got. Quite a bit. And there's some other bits and pieces that we need to take out from the construction process too. Now if you remember we're doing all of this to try and automate our train track production. So we've got our iron nuggets. But we're also going to need some stone slabs. 
and it won't accept cobblestone, it has to be stone. So the first thing we're going to need to do is to turn some of our cobblestone into stone blocks and then automate the turning of them into slabs. And looking at these barrels, I reckon we can use them for another purpose. So obviously some of that cobble is going straight down to be turned into gravel and then wash. But we can also put some funnels on here and we can blast that cobblestone to turn it into stone. So I think we should have a go at that. Okay, so we're done and I absolutely love the noises this thing makes. What's going on is the cobblestone is coming out of the barrels and along this upper conveyor belt. Then when it hits the lower one, it gets blasted by the lava. And there's just enough time for that to happen, turning it into stone before it goes through the funnels into these two additional vaults. From there, the stone comes out of these funnels on the sides. And that gets taken along here. And if I just go around the other side and show you, we've got exactly the same thing happening on the other side as well. The stone goes to this mechanical saw that turns it into slabs. And then we've got our two deployers deploying the iron nuggets onto those slabs to turn it into rail. This vault on top of those deployers is where they get those nuggets from and they are of course fed from the main bit. We've got a brass funnel here with a filter on just to take the nuggets out. And the belts that carry those nuggets are overhead as you can see going all the way into our item vault. We definitely need to decorate this thing because it is ugly and of course we need to actually place all the rail that we're making so that we can actually get our train moving. But we are already 20 minutes into the video, so I feel it's kind of time to stop. So maybe the next video is the one where we actually get our train to come all the way along here and back again. We can hope, right? It's quite a process, isn't it? I'll see you next time. Bye. When you left me at the end of the last episode, where did you go by the way? I hope you had a nice time. Anyway, when you left me, we had just finished making this rail track making factory thing. And we've got a fair bit more work to do. And hold on a second, there's cobblestone coming out of that vault behind me. That shouldn't be happening. Let me sort that out. That's better. And now we're going to decorate this place. And I know some of you are not very keen on me covering everything up, so I'm going to leave some bits exposed. And what we're going to do for this build is reverse the palette. So I've got these brick bond spruce planks that we're going to use for the main bits of the walls. And then we'll use cobblestone for the pillars, just to give us a little bit of variety in this area. And we're done, despite a few interruptions from the neighbours on the hill there. On this side I've put a few windows and glass doors in. That means that obviously we can get inside and we can see inside. Where's it gone? There's my building. We haven't hidden that movement completely. We can still see that's going on from the outside here. But popping inside we can get to all the bits and pieces in case we want to change anything or just come in and marvel at it. Over here I've put a funnel onto here so in case we ever want to get just a whole stack of stone then we can just grab one from there and the next one will appear. And if I pop around to the other side let's just show you all the way around it. We've got a few bits poking out here and there to add a bit of interest. And around here we've got a similar thing where we can get items out of the vaults really easily. Uh, this spell carries the uh, that stuff, the flint, up into this barrel here. Then we've got gravel just coming up onto this depot. And we've got another filter here for just about anything else that we want. And of course while we've been doing that, the machine has been working the entire time. And that means we've now got up to just under a stack of rail so we can now take all that train track down to the tunnels and hopefully that might be long enough to join up from here all the way to our island there's one other thing i need to show to you to introduce you to in fact let me just whistle for it there we go we have a horse a personal horse that we can call at any time and of course in true minecraft tradition the horse needs a name so name suggestions in the comments please so there's enough track to get us all the way here to where our train is and in fact 
there's even more track. We've got plenty of track. I don't think we're going to run out anytime soon. And that means at last the moment has come to try and get this train moving. But we need to do some finishing touches to it first because if I hop on board we don't have any controls or any seats on board and that's what we're going to need to sort out otherwise this thing is not going to move. Well we do now have a train that moves and it has taken a surprising amount of time to get it working. Not to get it moving, that was fine, but to get it going without taking half the station with it or without leaving half of the train behind. It's taken so many attempts, gluing and ungluing and so on, but we are there now. But our other problem is that the tunnel that we made wasn't quite big enough, so I've made it a block higher all the way along, which took a fair amount of time. The other problem we've got is the train tunnel is not quite wide enough, so if you look at the right hand side of the train as we move along, well you can't really see the side of the train, all you see is wall instead, and that's because we need to widen these tunnels. And to do that, and indeed to make our future rail tunnels just the right size, we're going to need to change our tunnel boring machine. We're going to need to make it a block higher and also a block wider on each side. But as always, there's something we need to do before we can do that, and that is with these filters that we're using on the deployers here. We're using these filters so that we can use this machine in the nether and in the overworld, both above and below deep slate level. So they will put down cobblestone or cobble deep slate or netherrack depending what we've got in the chests. I don't have enough filters for all the deployers that I want to put on here and that means we need to go and fetch some wool. Okay here's the expanded version of our big drilling machine. We've got a massive wall of deployers at the front here. They will fill in any water or lava sources that the machine comes across and then the blocks get drilled away behind leaving the tunnel. These ones on the edge don't get drilled away, they are full of tunnel lining. Behind our wall of deployers is a wall of drills to drill those blocks away and then at the bottom here we've got our deployers for the tunnel floor. Then behind those we are deploying our redstone torches and our powered rail just to keep the machine moving along and then at the back over here we've got these mechanical plows that will scoop those things back up again. Well the tunnel is now widened and Heightened? Is that a word? <laughs> it's the right height and the right width. The train can go along it without anything glitching out, which is great. But the next thing I want to do is to automate it. And for that, I'm going to need a couple of things. I'm going to need a train schedule, and here's one I made earlier. And I'm also going to need some mobs to drive it. But it just so happens that this is a slime chunk. And so actually, I've already got some volunteers. Now instead of having a driver at each end of the train and having the train go both ways, I think it makes more sense to just have a train having a front and a back. So I'm just going to make it go that way and we're going to get rid of this seat and train controls and yes, this driver as well. And that means I'm going to need to put in a turning loop at each end so that it's always going forwards, but that's okay. We've got loads of track. We can do that. What I don't have though is the space to actually make a turning circle. We've got just this narrow passage. And of course, if I get my tunnel boring machine out, it's just going to make more of the same. So we need something different. So I want to make a second drilling machine, one that's going to be a bit bigger in scale, but a bit simpler in function. So we're not going to bother with actually placing any blocks so there'll be no deployers just a whole bunch of drills i've got 44 here in my inventory so let's see what we can come up with so there we are it's as simple as that it's just eight columns of drills five high because that's how big we need it for our train to get along let's just glue it all together i've got an item vault on this side let's get around here and glue that in what I'm not doing is making this move along by itself. I'm just going to build a one wide tunnel, put my own rail down there and just push this thing along. That should do the trick. Now the way my tunnel is laid out, we've got the station here with the train in it. And as you can see, it kind of just glitches. That's the wrong word. It just goes over into the main tunnel, which goes along there. So what I'm going to do for the loop is just carry that on along this way 
and make it go along behind the station and loop round behind it there somewhere. That means of course we're going to make a bit of a junction here and we're going to have to work out how things like signals work but we'll come on to that. Several hours of mining later or at least getting the train machine thing to do the mining and we have a turning loop at both ends. Now some of these corners are a bit tight they're pretty much as tight as you can possibly get so I think they might be a little bit uncomfortable when we're coming around them on the train and we might need to give ourselves a bit more space in the future but for now at least everything joins up and we should be able to get the train going from one end to the other automatically so let's hop on board and see just how bad it is shall we so this is the loop at the industrial base end let's start driving yeah that's pretty tight isn't it you wouldn't want that on a real train and we're now approaching the other end. This one swings backwards and forwards a little bit before it turns, but the turn isn't quite as bad. It swings all the way around. Whoa, well, that's a sharp turn, isn't it? That is a sharp turn. So definitely a little bit of room for improvement, but we should now at last be able to figure out the scheduling thing. So I've got my train schedule, but first of all, I'm going to dispense of one of these slimes. Just like that. And we're off. Now that we've got things working functionally, it's time to sort out the aesthetics because although behind me I've got a bit of a station and it kind of looks well decent if I turn around well there's a train <laughs> if I turn around it's, it's just a mess and this whole platform and situation needs sorting out uh, and as for the other station this place just needs an awful lot of work i think i'm just about there with this platform so for the walls i've just carried on with the deep slate tiles that we have on the other side of the track over there the ceiling i've left pretty raw so that's just a combination of deep slate cobbled deep slate and whatever ended up up there to be honest i'm very pleased with these lights though these andesite caged lights we've only got the is it four of them along here yeah one two three four and they are enough to light up the platform. We also have a couple at these tunnel entrances behind me. We will want to decorate these walls behind me a little bit more. I just need a few more paintings and things like that to go on there. But I have put in some seats that we can sit on while we're waiting for the trains. And these tunnels to the sides, well, they don't really go anywhere. These ones at the ends, you can see through to the other track, which is quite a nice thing when there's a train coming. At both ends of the station, I really want it to be dark and a proper tunnel like it is on the real tube. So I've slabbed along the sides of the track and underneath the track in order to spawn proof it, removed all the torches so it really is quite dark. I've got to admit, it's not entirely spawn proof. We've probably got a little bit more to do, but the idea is there. We need to do a bit more work, but I love how dark those tunnels are now. Because the rest of the decor is pretty dark, I decided to go with a pretty bright floor, as you can see. This is rough, smooth stone, believe it or not, that we've got on, under my feet here. And we've just got some split blocks under my feet now, just to get this yellowed safety line in. You'll also notice the platform is currently too long for the train. And that's because at the moment the train's only got one carriage and I'd like to give it at least two or three. So with this one all done, I've just got to remember what I've done and go and apply exactly the same thing to the other end. This platform is much shorter than the other one, but I've carried on with the same kind of decoration, exactly the same tiles and things around here. I've changed the floor up just a little bit, a bit more texturing on this side. The lanterns are a slightly different variety as well. These are iron ones where we've got andesite ones at the other station. But when we make our train bigger, we can of course extend the station, so that's all fine. So we've got a fully operational metro system, completely automatic, with all the stations decorated. That's pretty good progress. Up here on the surface though, we've got some pretty decent looking buildings now. I do like this cluster of buildings, but the landscape around here well, we need to do a bit of work on this because it is a mess. So that's something I want to do in the next episode. But the other thing I really want to do is I want to explore this ocean behind me because it's just calling to me. I want to know what's over there. 
I still want to try and find some jungle and dark oak and some dripstone. We've got loads of materials that we need to go and try and find. So I'm hoping that if we sail over that way, we might be able to find some of the things we're looking for. So a bit of decorating, a bit of exploring. I think the next episode's going to be a good one. I hope you've enjoyed this one. I'll see you next time. Bye. I'm going inside. I'm getting wet. Hello, hello, hello. At the end of the last episode, I was standing here, well, roughly here, and saying that I wanted to go exploring that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in a boat and I'm going to go exploring that way. Sometimes, just sometimes, I do actually do what I say I'm going to go and do. Now I've got no idea what we're going to find over here. I haven't looked at the maps or the, uh, any kind of download or anything at all. I've literally no idea. There's a bee with no land around it. Well, I wasn't expecting that for a start. But what I am hoping to find is some dark oak and some jungle, because those are the two wood types I don't have yet. I'd also like to try and find some dripstone caves, but obviously that involves going underground a bit, so I'm not going to bother with that. But we are going to see if we can find some new terrains. A warm ocean would be quite nice as well. Everything we've found so far has been really cold. Well, I've managed to find this tiny little island. But actually, it's a bit bigger than that. So there I was saying I hoped we were going to find something nice and warm and we found some ice spikes. Brilliant. Well, if I ever need to find some ice, I know where to come. Look at this place. It's huge. This is going to make me some great ice boating. Well, I'm over 5,000 blocks away from spawn now and I'm still going west and it's still very, very icy. And now there's a freezing cold rain lashing down as well. I think the time has come to say the answer to the question of what's to the west is cold ocean icy stuff. And I should turn around and go home. So with random exploring not really being very helpful for finding these things, I decided it's time to get a little bit of help. And that help comes in the shape of this thing here that I'm holding. It's a nature's compass and it lets me find particular biomes and it will guide me to them. So if I come out of F1 mode, you can see that if I look for a bamboo jungle, there's one that's just about 6,000 blocks away. And that's not too far away at all. We can make that. Out of interest though, where is the nearest dark oak? The dark forest, searching for it. And that's only 5,000 blocks away. Okay, well we need to go and find both of those things. And the compass will guide us here. It looks like both of them are pretty much to our north somewhere. So let's go, shall we? And there it is, a dark oak forest. That's exactly what we want. So I'm just going to chop down some of the trees on the edge here, these dark oak ones, and get as many dark oak saplings as I can. And I'll see you in a bit. Well, I've got almost a stack of dark oak saplings, and that should be enough to be getting on with. So let's go and find some jungle, shall we? Bamboo jungle is the first one that comes up because it's alphabetical order. Let's just search for that one, shall we? That's still 2,000 blocks away. Is there a closer jungle? That's one and a half thousand blocks away. Let's go for that one. And it looks as if we're actually moving into a warm biome as well by the changing colour there. And here is our jungle. Superb. Hello there. Do you like a banana? And now I've got 23 jungle saplings, which isn't many. It isn't a full stack or anything, but it should be plenty to get started with a jungle tree farm. Before I move on to the next thing, I just want to make a couple of upgrades to my backpack. The first one is a crafting upgrade, which essentially lets me have a pretty much a mobile crafting table. I can craft stuff anytime I want. There we go, we've got the quest as well. The other thing I want is the foodie one. Oh, hello. That's the one, the feeding upgrade. What do we need for that? I think I've got everything I need for this, except for the ender pearl. If I make my way into the nether and find a walked forest, then that's where you can find endermen. So maybe I should do that. I'm geared up now. I mean, looking at the map, finding a walked forest isn't too hard. There's one 
pretty much behind me over there. There we go. As well as exploring, the other thing I mentioned at the end of the last episode that I wanted to do was to terraform around my industrial area. So I'm going to head over there right now. And the area I'm talking about is this area here. It's, um, yeah, it needs, just needs a bit of work, that's all. So now this is what it's looking like. It's a lot greener and a little bit flatter in places. So I filled in some of the dips and flattened out some of the hills. I haven't completely got rid of all of the sand, but we'll probably do that a bit more in due course because let's face it, it's ridiculous that a beach that starts over there comes all the way this far into the island. Talking of grass, I do need to come and bone meal some of this so that it's not quite so flat, but overall it's looking quite good. We do have some bits that are pretty deliberately flat so that we can build more buildings and put some farms on these places. And in fact, that's what we're going to do very soon. I've chucked some very basic paths in around the place just for the, the main places where I tend to walk. But this is a create mod series and it wouldn't be a create episode if we didn't make some kind of... Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I found a waystone on my way to the woods. Uh, it's, it's many, many blocks away and I didn't pick it up. So it's over there and it's kind of annoying me. I'll have to go back somewhere at some point and pick that up. Anyway, as I was saying, this is a create series and it wouldn't be a create episode without making some kind of create farm. And that's what we're going to do now. Now that we've been to the woods and we've got our dark oak and our jungle, I think we need to make a tree farm that can harvest those. And standing here waiting for the train makes me think I should start using those waystones sooner rather than later. But now I'm on board the train, we've actually got a new driver. The uh, other driver is still over there, the slimy one, you can see him over that way. Uh, but this bat has volunteered to drive the train as well, and he seems to be doing quite a good job. So we might get rid of the slimy friend over there, because that bat looks so cute with his little driver hat on. But we'll play with the trains again in another episode, because for today I really want to concentrate on the tree farm. And we've got this one behind me, which is working great for the single stem. Uh, trees, things like the cherry, and we've got a bit of spruce in there, oak, birch, those kind of things, acacia. Well, that's all of them, isn't it? I've listed them all. But for the two by two trees, the dark oak, and actually the jungle and spruce again, I'd like to make a slightly bigger and, well, it has to be a bigger farm because that's too small for those. So we're probably going to take the spruce out of there and we'll make a jungle, dark oak and spruce farm over at the other base. So the idea is I'm going to have a powered minecart rail going along behind me. Yeah, pretty much like that one there. And then I'm going to plant the trees over this side. And the idea is we'll have a minecart contraption that basically whizzes up and down here, harvests them and chucks all the logs and stuff into storage that's that's the idea but as always nothing is ever quite as simple as it seems because although i've got plenty of mechanical saws well actually i've only got six but we can make more of those what i don't have any of at all is deployers for deployers we need brass and to make brass we're gonna need some copper and some zinc Unfortunately, we've got a decent supply of that that just comes through this machine here. But this lack of deployers is a recurring problem for me. So I think before I do the tree farm, I'm going to have to make a brass farm. Why do we call everything that does anything automatically a farm in Minecraft? It's not a farm, it's just a machine. Anyway, for our brass farm, we need a blaze burner with a basin on top of it and a mixer that goes on top of that. And the mixer needs to be powered and the blaze burner also needs to be fueled. So we need to work out how we're going to get the fuel into there, the copper and zinc from there down into here and power to here. So we've got three things that we need to sort out and then it will all magically work. So I'm going to have a bit of a fiddle about to try and work out the best place to put that and how to get all those things going into it and um, well i'll see you in a minute well a little while later and i think we're there so uh, as you can see we've got our gizmo in here let's start at the top shall we see so we've got some spinning cogs that's taking the power out of a water wheel that is through this wall here so we've got a speed controller here and that's just putting that through the only other useful that water wheel that's the one that's making this conveyor belt 
the one you can see up there go really slowly because that's the one that we're using to, uh, to blast things with. And up behind our um, basin there, can I, can I see it from this side? Mm, yeah, just about. You can see there's a funnel on there with a filter on it. So that's taking stuff out of that blasted belt. And that will obviously just take in our copper and our zinc and put that into the basin. Then for fueling the blaze burner, we've got another new belt along here. It's quite a fast one because we've linked it up to the other mechanisms over that side. And that just will take stuff out of here. So if I put something flammable in there, what have I got? That will do, those spruce planks. They should set the blaze burner going if they go in there. Are they getting stuck underneath? No, they're just not feeding into it. Hmm, okay. Well, it looks like blaze burners have to be fed with a deployer, which is a bit annoying. Okay, let's sort that out. There we are, that should do the trick. The final bit of the process is that the resulting brass comes straight out of the basin onto this belt and along into that barrel there. Now the only problem with this setup is that the blaze burner will use up the fuel even if there's nothing being mixed in the basin above it. So there's no point filling the barrel up with fuel if there's no copper and zinc going through to be turned into brass. But the benefit of that is that because the blaze burner won't normally be fueled, the copper and zinc will just go into the basin and wait for fuel to appear there. So if ever we want to get copper or zinc out without it turning into brass, we can just get that out of the barrel. And if we do want brass, we just chuck some fuel in the barrel and we'll get our brass out. So it's kind of a disadvantage, but I'm going to pretend it's a good thing. I mean, I could set up some clever mechanism so that it detects whether there's stuff in the basin and then only puts the fuel out of the barrel if there is, but that's just too complicated and frankly, I'm happy with the way it is. So let's just prove that this thing works, shall we? Normally, the copper and zinc would be in ore form, go into this chest here, and then it would come out of the funnel on the other side and it would get blasted along that conveyor belt and it would turn into copper and zinc ingots. So what we're going to do, if I just climb up here, we'll chuck some copper and zinc just onto the conveyor belt as if it had been blasted, and then well, we should be able to see the whole process work. So let's uh, stack of copper, missed, come on, there it is, and a stack of zinc. They should both appear in that barrel. 16 copper ingot, 16 zinc ingot. Okay, and you take 16 in so the rest goes into the chest. I guess so. So that's sitting in there. Then we chuck some fuel into here. The mixer starts up. And we've got some we made earlier. We should get some more. There we go. We get some brass ingots going in. Satisfying, isn't it? With a bunch of deployers now in my hot bar, it's time to finally try and sort the tree farm out. And the first thing I'm going to do is clear a couple of columns of this grass behind me so it'll go along parallel to the minecart track there because we only want a few patches where we can actually deploy the saplings. There we are, and now I'm going to fill these trenches in with something that the saplings cannot grow on and every four blocks or so we'll pop in a two by two of dirt. So now it's time to actually make the machine. Well, in theory that's most of the machine done. Let's just make sure these deployers are only going to put down the saplings we want. So let's do dark oak there, uh, jungle in the middle and we'll do spruce on the end over here. The other thing I want to do, of course, is to get some stuff out of this machine while it's going. So for that, we're going to need some storage interfaces. And then I'm just going to put a belt coming out of this storage interface and put that into a vault. So something like that should do the trick. So if I've done this right, and bear in mind these things never actually work first time, uh, just need to glue it together and set it going, and that's kind of it. a nudge well okay 
that hasn't entirely worked. Ah, this is bad. Come back! Come back! You what the French call les incompetents. So back in the cart assembler, I think if I click on that, we change it so it doesn't always face towards motion. We lock rotation. I think that's the one. That's where the saplings have gone. They've all been put into the vault. Okay, so we need to make sure the saplings don't go out of there. Now the obvious thing to do is to stick a filter on here to stop the saplings coming out, but my worry then is that the machine over here is just going to fill up with saplings eventually and won't be able to pick up anything else that it harvests. But right now I can't think of another way around it, so I think I'm going to do that. I'll just have to keep an eye on it. Eventually it'll probably run out of space and we'll just see a load of logs hanging around here and we'll just have to empty out of saplings manually i guess i don't know we'll we'll find out so i've got a list filter in fact it's something i used earlier uh so we want dark oak jungle and spruce saplings oh and the other thing is we want it to be a deny list so don't let these things come out we'll chuck that on here pop it back down again send it on its way yes look at that that's what we wanted oh no I forgot the rotation thing again. Oh no, there's saplings everywhere. That all seems to be working very well indeed, and we've got quite a bit of stuff in the vault already. And I think the next challenge is going to be working out how we get stuff out of that vault and all the way back over to our main storage in our island way over there somewhere. And that's definitely going to be a job for next time. So thanks for your company today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm really pleased with this. And I'm going to say the standard YouTuber thing. Only a small percentage of you are actually subscribed to the channel. So if you don't want to miss the next episode, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And hopefully, I'll see you next time. Bye! Welcome back. At the end of the last episode, we completed this here tree farm. And we talked about how we wanted to get the logs out of this vault behind me, all the way over to our storage, which is in another island, way over this way somewhere. And in the episode before that, we fully automated our underground rail system. You can call it a metro or a subway or whatever. I'm from London, so I'm going to call it a tube. So today we want to combine those things together, grabbing the stuff from the industrial area above my head, many, many blocks up there, bringing them down here, loading them onto the trains, taking them all the way to the other end, and then taking them from the station at the other end up into our storage. And at the same time we want to make our trains and our platforms a bit longer and make some of our farms and machines around this area a little bit smarter so they're not producing things when we don't need them anymore. But first I want to thank you for your, all your name suggestions for this fella here. I'm sorry we didn't name him in the last episode. If you were thinking that's because something had happened to him, no, he's absolutely fine, there he is. But he does need a name, so let's have a look at some of the contenders. I really like this suggestion from Lawful Media based on this here cartoon. Oh, Belvedere, come here, boy. But the winner from Crafty Stevo is Derby. That's gonna be your new name, Derby. What do you think? Do you like it? We'll call that a yes. So back here at the starter island in our storage, I do actually have a name tag. There we go. So let's go and call Derby and give him his new name. I better actually name the name tag, hadn't I? So just grab one of those, pop it down there. There he is. Derby. Let's get down to business then, and that means literally going down. Now the train that we've got, I actually made right here at this station. And as you can see, there's not really a lot of room for manoeuvre around the train. So I want to make a separate place where we can do maintenance on our trains and just kind of make new ones, make them longer, all of that kind of thing. And that means we need somewhere with a lot more space. But we're deep underground, so taking these up to the surface isn't really an option. But that's okay, because I've got a plan. And that plan involves doing something you should never do. That's pop off the platform and run along the live rails. Don't try that at home. So just a little bit along from the station which is over behind me. You can see obviously we've got the main rail going along here. We've actually got another tunnel that I built along here. Doug I should say. You dig tunnels not build them don't you? 
So this was originally going to be my main railway tunnel and as you can see it goes up a few blocks and the idea was it was going to go up towards the surface as we reached the industrial area at the other end. So the whole thing was going to be on a slope but I decided to abandon that idea and go for a flat tunnel behind me instead. But it does mean we've got all this space to play with and this would be pretty much perfect for our train building depot place thing. It probably needs a little bit more mining out and there's only one problem with that and that's above my head here there is a massive mine shaft full of cave spider spawners and all of that stuff so we need to be a little bit careful if we're digging up but for the most part i think we're going to be digging along and sideways just to give ourselves plenty of space to build our trains right there's a cave spider spawner but there's also something else through there no idea what that is i don't think i really want to find out now I could actually do with a decent source of string because from there I can get wool and that means we can make filters and all kinds of other things. So I am actually going to make use of that cave spider spawner and make a bit of a farm with it. Now I don't need the experience from the spiders because we've got this zombie farm for that. So that means that we can use drop damage to kill our spiders and that makes the farm nice and easy. The question of course is where should I build it? So I'm going to put the spider farm here inside this square that I've marked out and because we're using drop damage but we do want to be able to activate the spawner without having to climb up to it I'm going to set it so that actually some of that drop damage will go down below the sea level here so we're going to mine out and uh, dry out the area below me so that the spiders will drop from up here somewhere all the way down and then we'll be able to pick up the drops. So I've dug my shaft down and lined it with these bricks as you can see. We're about 11 blocks down here so we need to go up a little bit further. A cave spider has 6 hearts of health and they will lose half a heart for each block of falling that they will do below the third block that they spawn from. So they, wherever they spawn they can fall 3 blocks and then they take half a block of damage beyond that. Basically we need to make sure they are spawning up five or so blocks above the top of this which should be fine but obviously we want to collect the items so that's what I'm going to work on and that's why I am holding this shaft now let's uh, pop some of these in and on here so the idea is that the spiders will fall onto these belts and they will die from the drop damage instantly and just turn into their drops basically so then we just need to take their drops away I don't know why I'm doing them all from that end. <laughs> the bolts are going to go in that direction, but that doesn't mean I can't place them from the other end. And yeah, we're just going to collect these things up and get them up to the surface. So then we're going to pop another belt in on the end here. Pop that in there. That's it. That's going to go in this direction. So basically everything will come from wherever it lands over to this corner here. Then we need to get it up that way. So the idea is we've got a fan in the bottom there and that will blow things up the chute. So they should come off this conveyor and pop down on top of the fan and that will blow them up the chute and then we'll get them into some storage up there. Now obviously we need to power that fan and we need to power these belts. So that's the next thing to do. Okay, so that's all working down there now. We just need to go and get the actual spawner. I wonder if that weird ghosty thing's still down there. No, oh, it looks like we're in the clear. That's good news. Oh, hello slime. Right, so we need to get down underneath the spawner there. Actually, wow, that's right above the train tracks. Who knew? Track. Assembler. Minecart. I'm getting it in the right order now. How about that? Here comes the train. And then we should be able to pick it up. Yes, job done. So now up here we just want to do more or less the same thing in reverse. So let's get the track down and the carp assembler. We'll pop the contraption down there which should just be our spawner. That's the one. It's got the torch on it too. Okay, so I've built up the sides just to make sure it is flat on the inside. Obviously that also means it's flush on the outside at the moment which looks a little bit weird and we can add a bit more sort of shape to it on the outside but the main thing is to make sure it works internally first. So I'm just going to block this up with the uh, cherry planks here and then we'll go and switch it on and remove that torch. In fact we could probably do that now, we should be fairly safe. Make sure the thing's working and then we'll have a think about trying to make the roof look good. Well it seems to be working, we're getting some spiders spawning, they're falling down to their deaths. I'm getting a little bit of string in here and popping into free cam just to see inside the farm to make sure everything's okay. Things seem to be working pretty well. 
there is a tiny bit of light down in that corner where the water wheel and that well where the end of the belt is but that's not affecting the rates uh, for the spawning up here so we should be right to leave it there we go there's some spiders so now the challenge is to make this building look half reasonable so let's see what we can do there we are that is a spider farm all 100 percent done and with that distraction out of the way it's time to return back down here to my underground train shed so we've got a few more blocks to clear above my head there and a lot of tidying up to do so let's get on. So what I'd like to do with this area is make it an arched roof and I'd like to slab the floor. So basically I've done essentially a tile of that behind me. You can just about make it out in the deep slate tiles there. And I figure instead of trying to place all of those blocks myself, why don't I try using this schematic cannon for it? First I've got to find the thing because it's not in my storage. And of course it's where we left it over here. There we go. So I've got myself a schematic and quill, and that's the thing I need to create the schematic. Well, it certainly works, but to be honest, I think it'll be quicker to place the blocks myself. <laughs> and with that all done, it's nearly time to get the train rails in here. But first, I want to sort out the lighting. We don't need lighting because the entire floor is slabbed, but well, we need it to be able to see, don't we? And what I think I want is some lights that are hanging from the ceiling instead of these torches along the sides here. For the fancy lights, we need a tinkering table, which I just happen to have just crafted one here. And for that we grab some lanterns and chuck them in here and then we've got a whole load of options. It's quite hard to see what they look like. And we're done. And it's a bit dark and dingy, but that's okay. Over behind me, as you can see, it's not entirely spawnproof over there. And I've been struggling to work out exactly where those spawning spots are. Bye Creeper. <laughs> but fortunately Create gives us an easy way to find out where those spawning spots are without the need for any additional mods or overlays and that's what I'm going to do now. So I need to get myself a brass sheet and a block of brass. So nine bits of brass like that, chuck them into a block and that means that I can make a peculiar bell. Uh, other way around. That's it. Then with this peculiar bell I need to haunt it. I put a fan down here and uh, let's put a fire there and chuck a depot down here actually I don't even need to, to lower the block just put that back put the depot there and put my bell on top of it that's not my bell here's my bell I've got a crank handle here and we're just gonna Turn this bell into a haunted bell. Like that. There we go. And the job's done. So now by holding the haunted bell, I can see those particles there. And in fact, if I put it down somewhere, like that, what a noise. We should see those particles again, and that should tell us where those spawning spots are. Yeah, there we go. Now, one thing I've realized is that this is all a block, or at least half a block lower than this stuff over here. And that's not ideal, especially as actually this level I'm on now, uh, a block lower than that main line, this is the same level as our line through the station behind me. So it actually comes up a block, and then we're thinking about making it go down a block again in order to come into here. And that seems a bit silly. So I think what I need to do is essentially lower all of this rail along here down by a block. And um, that could take a little while. So I'm going to try and sort some of this out and I'll bring you back when I'm done. Okay, so this is all now nicely on the same level behind me. And as you can see, I've got a rail that now comes in here and I've brought the train in here too. The only problem is I can't reach it. So we need to do something about that. Now in the darkness behind me over here, we've got a train station that I've created. And if I click on that, we can see that's called Train Depot, which you know, seems a reasonable name for this. And that means we can pop the train into assembly mode so with the train disassembled we can just add more bogies by placing train casings on the track and that will create our additional carriages so i want to go a couple of blocks out from there so that's the end of that carriage i want two blocks and then i want my bogey about 
there. So inside this carriage, this is the carriage we already had, we've got cherry wood along the bottom here and barrels along the side. And I'm going to swap them out so the barrels are going all the way along the bottom of the train. And we'll do the same with our other carriages. So now my train is three times longer than it was before. I've made one or two other changes as well. Let me hop inside and I'll show you. So let's head to the front first of all. I've just moved these control panels. Uh, well, this one, I've moved it forward a bit. And I put the other one from the rear of the train so that the one driver can go in both directions. You'll notice the driver is missing. Uh, in order to put this in, I had to remove the door that was there. And of course, I had to remove the seat as well. And our friend, the bat, decided to fly away. So we're going to get an, another driver in here. That could be fun. Uh, we've got plenty of seating in here, which considering this is a single player world might seem overkill, but I did want it to look a bit like a tube train and they are full of seats. And of course removing that door from the front of the train means that the front looks ever so slightly different, but it still looks alright to me. So now we need to glue it all together and take it for a spin to make sure it is really all sorted out. I'm just going to drive it over to the industrial area station just to see how, how long we need to make that platform. I've realised the very front of the train here is missing, so we'll have to sort that out. And yeah, this... We've got the two, first two carriages on. Yeah, we need to go along a bit further that way, not too far. Just dig that out so we can see where that door ends. And it's there. Okay. So a bit more digging out, but we're almost there. That's great. Well, it looks like I might have another volunteer driver if we can get him into the right seat. Just need to convince the bat to come and sit here. I can't put a lead on it because you can't put leads on bats. there yes perfect now in terms of getting storage interfaces onto the train i'm gonna put four on two at the back and two at the front and i'm gonna replace that block there of them so that one goes like that and that one there and the same on the other side and that way it doesn't matter which direction the train goes in there should be a storage interface in the same place so that should make things easier at the stations. Now because these things can actually go through a block, I could hide them in the middle so that they're actually, you just see the blue on the outside here. But I don't really think I need to do that. The problem with doing that is that they would then have to be offset because they can't face both directions at the same time. Um, and I quite like the idea of them being in the same place on both sides of the train. It just makes things a little bit easier. So now the challenge is going to be to get items out of the storage from the train and bring it up here and into our storage warehouse over there. And the way I'm going to try and do that is to link up the storage drawers. Hopefully we're not too far away down there from our master over there in the middle of the warehouse. We've already linked things over here to our tree farm. So let's just get down there. We can see we've got a slave down there that the tree farm is going into and that's linked by these trims all the way over to the warehouse. So basically we need to carry on linking things down with these trims all the way down to where our trains are and link it up to here hopefully and then that should work. So at the bottom here our trim comes down just behind the lift shaft. And if I break through to here, we should get the very end of our railway station. There it is. So the train will come in there. We just need to work out exactly where that storage interface comes off. And then hook it up to this. So I guess we're just waiting for a train. <laughs> so it lines up exactly with that redstone for the lift. Of course it does. Of course it does. Okay, so the train's in and clearly that's the storage interface we want to interact with. And I've brought the trim over this side, so we just need to bring that down here. So if I put our drawer controller slave there and we hook up a belt between the two things, then that should be all we need to do. 
So that should unload things from the train and bring them across here. And the question is, are we in range of our drawers upstairs? There's only one way to find out, and that's to chuck something on the belt. And sure enough, it doesn't go anywhere. And that suggests we are not within our range. So we're going to need to get our items up to the surface a different way. And I'm wondering if we can use the same trick we used on the string farm and use a chute with a fan at the bottom. What I don't know is how far up we'll be able to send those items. So let's have a ponder and see what it says. Here we go, so we place a fan at the bottom and our chutes at the top. So it tells us about the direction, but it doesn't tell us how far it will be able to go. So I've switched things around down here. We've got a large water wheel in so we can get the speed up to maximum. We've got our chutes there linked to a fan that is blowing away upwards. And as you can see, things are pushed upwards. We've got our belt in, so everything should then go into that chute and all the way up. Well, I say all the way up. Let's go and find out. So back at the top of the chute, things look promising. We can see that we've got air coming out of there and it still says items move upwards, which is perfect. That's what we want. So all we need to do now is link that across to our storage in the same way as we did before with the trims. And hopefully that should be sufficient to get items in there. Here we are, so I'm just putting these belts onto there and they have disappeared. Let's see where they've gone. Yep, there they are, 60 belts. Perfect. So having sorted this end out, we'll be our way to get the stuff off of the train and up into our storage. Now we've got to sort the other end out. We're trying to get stuff from our farms onto the train. What I want to set up is a central place to bring all the stuff together. And then we work out what from there actually gets sent down to the train because it won't be everything all the time. Okay, so it's a little while later and I've been busy. Let me show you what I've been up to. If I pop up here into our lift or our elevator, whatever you want to call it, we've got a new level. So if I pop down to here, we've got something called storage. And if I pop in here, it's got loads of things coming into it. As you can see, we are using the storage drawers. This is our master drawer controller right here. And we're using that to pull all the items in from the various places. If I just mine behind here a little bit and go along, there we go. So you can see we've got a couple of trims coming in. So this one comes in from the iron farm and that one over there comes in from the tree farm. Let's just put that back. So here at the tree farm, basically what I've done is under this vault, we've just put a whole load of shoots that go down and pop into our drawer storage slave thingamy and that joins our line of trims that go across into our storage and then i've done a similar thing here so again we've got a line of shoots coming down from these output chests and over here it's a bit messy but it's quite nice actually i quite like the industrial look of it again a bunch of shoots that come out so basically i've changed these belts so they go into drawers so we can see what's going on here put those drawers empty straight into these chutes and it all joins up into this drawer controller slave. So basically I can take whatever I want out of these drawers and I can chuck them into this barrel. And under here again, there's a whole bunch of chutes that go down to our station. And down here on the platform, that's the bottom of that line of chutes. They come into another storage vault there. There's those zinc ingots that you just saw me pop in. And that goes down here into a portable storage interface that links up to our train. So we've got a way of getting our stuff from these farms at the industrial area onto a train. And we've got a way of getting stuff off of the train and into our main storage at the other end. And you might think that's it, but you'd be wrong. And the reason for that is we've got portable storage interfaces at each end of the train. And the stuff is collecting into here and then it gets collected from the other end. And what I noticed was the items in these barrels we're not being emptied out when we get to the station at the other end. And I don't really know why that was, but I've managed to fix it. So here's our original portable storage interface that deals with the front of the train as it comes in. And all I've done is I've popped another portable storage interface that links to the rear of the train and this massive belt, or actually three belts, that joins it all up together. So when the train comes back, 
we should see a whole load of items coming back out of this and all the way up into our storage. Meanwhile, this belt is quite good fun just to ride along. Look at this. Whee! So that's just about it for this episode. There's nothing else to show you. Nothing else at all. Hello, welcome to episode 10 from my series on Mr. Beardstone's Create Perfect World Mod Pack. And truth be told, I've already recorded this introduction once, except, well, it didn't actually record. I've lost all the clips from it. So let me tell you what you've missed. You missed me reminding you that we started the last episode by naming a horse and we finished the last episode by seeing the death of that horse. And the death of that horse was caused by this here tree farm, so you missed me building this fence around it. You also missed me finding a new horse and giving this new horse a name. So I'm proud to present to you Derby 2 who apparently has already lost half a heart of health. Let's not talk about that. And although Derby 2 is a little bit faster than the original Derby was, you missed me talking about how horses are not the best way to get around. And although we've got trains which are a lot faster than horses, you missed me saying that trains aren't the best way to get around either. And that's because you missed me saying that we've got waystones in this pack and we can make waystones fairly easily using these things except for, well, warpstones, so we talked about those. And you missed me saying that we can get all of these fairly easily. We can get the emeralds from our village and we can get some amethyst shards. And you missed me saying that I previously thought we couldn't move these things and yet actually Oh, I don't have a minecart. <laughs> but yes, actually we can. <laughs> and to prove it, here's a block we moved earlier. And you missed me coming to this warped forest in the nether and clearing this massive space here for endermen to spawn so that we can get some ender pearls. And you missed me saying that I'd probably make some automatic enderman farm in this area at some point in the distant future. But just in clearing the space, we managed to kill enough endermen to get the ender pearls that we wanted for our waystones. And then finally you missed me crafting the waystones and placing them here in my storage, here in my industrial area, here in the village where we've made our trading hall, here in the other village that's really near to the nether fortress in the nether, and then we renamed this waystone here in the middle of this birch forest which was on our way to the dark forest and the jungle that we made earlier and this is a naturally occurring waystone so I decided not to move it. Now having recorded all of those clips and got them into my video editor I can see that they do at least exist but they all recorded without any game sounds so just to prove that I fixed that There you are, there's a bit of game sound going on. And this is just how easy it is to use these waystones and how quick it is to navigate around now. So this is gonna make life so much easier for getting around, so much quicker, and we should be able to get a lot of stuff done. So apart from the things I've done that you didn't see me do, what else are we actually going to achieve in this episode? Well, for that, I'm gonna go all the way back over here and we're gonna come back here to our starter house. Because our starter houses go, there really isn't much going on here at all. But essentially that means it's episode 10 and I don't actually have a create workshop, which is pretty much the first thing people do when they play this kind of mod pack. Now, if you don't know what a workshop is in create, it's basically a place where we can have all of the main create contraptions, simple ones, laid out together so the things that kind of crush things mix things drill things all of that kind of stuff all put together in one place so if we just want to make something very quickly we can do it and this is be our one place to do it we've kind of got the start of a workshop over here in our industrial area where we've got a deployer a mechanical press and a spout for putting liquids onto things so this is the kind of thing we want to make but we want it over in our house and um, yeah, we want a few more bits and pieces in it than this. So I guess the first thing for me to do is to tear all of this down and take it home. It's a little while later and I've been a busy plod. Come and see what I've been up to. So going in, we've got a bunch of depots here with various things above them. 
So we've got a dispenser here, not a dispenser, a deployer, that's the thing. And we can chuck stuff into it so it deploys particular things. Uh, we've got a, a mechanical press here to do all the squishing. We've got a mixer and a basin and underneath there you can see there's a blaze burner. And we've got our spout back here as well. And you can see that that's all taking its power down from below. We've got a bunch of water wheels down here. But first let me show you this side. We've got all the fanny things. Am I allowed to say that? The things related to fans. Yeah, that's fine, isn't it? Okay, so we've got the lava, we've got the two campfires, we've got the water there, and you can see that's shoving all the lovely coloured particles down there to do the things for the blasting and the haunting and whatever the other two do. Smoking, I think that one is, and washing. That's it, I remember the things. See, I know Create Mod. And yeah, just down here, just to show you the mess of water wheels we've got, because I could have powered it a different way, but no, water wheels are easy. So I've done water wheels. Pop back up again, because that's not all of it. I go outside, and round the corner, we've got some crushing wheels here as well to do more crushy things. I did think about putting one of the, the mini uh, grinder things in here. What are they called? Hold on, what are they called? Millstones. One of them, yeah. I was going to put a millstone in there. And, uh, but no, crushing wheels are much better than millstones. They do everything millstones can and a lot more besides. So I thought, yeah, let's put this on here. Maybe it's about time I actually updated the look of these walls because it's what I had at the time. It was the first night. I just needed somewhere indoors to get away from the phantoms because I had no bed. So yeah, it was cobblestone and wood because that's what I had. But we can do better than that now. So maybe we need to prettify the house as well. And this is what my starter house looks like now. It's pretty much the same dimensions as it was before. In fact, it's exactly the same dimensions as it was before. These are actually framed blocks, so we can actually change this out for any texture we want, whenever we want to, really. And inside, we've done up the floor as well as the walls and things, so it is looking a lot neater and a lot better. It's certainly looking better out here, where we've got rid of all the plants that were here. I think we do need to texture up this path at some point, make it look a bit better, a little bit janky, it's a bit too straight and neat at the moment, and uh, do something with this ground just to make it look a bit more interesting, but I think it's better like this than it was before. And with that all done, we can make just about anything. And that's pretty good because uh, there is something I really, really want to make. And it actually takes us back to where we started with our modes of transport. Because I want to be able to fly and that means I need a jetpack. So I can make a brass one, an andesite one or a copper one. Well, okay, we can get plenty of any of those things. So four copper ingots, a couple of fluid tanks, andesite alloy, a hydraulic engine. I don't know what that is and a cogwheel so hydraulic engine bolt spout and a couple of crushing things so copper sheet water on top of it and then crush it twice okay so first I want to make a copper sheet there it is uh, then I pop that on there and we want some water to go in it there we go incomplete hydraulic engine Oh, bring the bucket back, thank you. And then it just needs to go... Oh, it still needs something else. It needs to do it again, does it? Is it more water and then... Yeah, okay, fine. And there it is, hydraulic engine. So with that all done, we should now be able to make our copper jetpack. There it is, look at that. So I can see that it wants some water in it because there's zero out of 1600 water. So I'll oh, shift for summary and control for controls. Let's do that. So take a step back from your constructions by flying in the sky. You need to water to operate. Put it in your off hand and drop your water by pressing Q, water bottle or water bucket. Okay. So I put this in my off hand. I'll get some water buckets. Drop these. That seems to be doing the job. I can fly! I can fly! I'm flying! Wow, okay. 
that's kind of weird. Our workshop is sorted, our transport is sorted, and off camera I've even had time to go and make a big shiny axe, or at least trade with the villagers to get a fully enchanted axe. Let me show you what's on here. There we go, mending, silk touch, efficiency 5, unbreaking 3, all the good things. And that means we're ready to tackle just about anything, which is just as well, because in the next episode, I want to tackle one of the mods in this pack that we've hardly touched at all. But more about that next time. For now, that's about it, I'm afraid. It's a shorter episode than usual, partly because it was my birthday last week and Mrs. Plod's birthday, so we've spent quite a lot of time with friends and family celebrating which means I haven't had quite the same amount of time for Minecrafting as usual. So yeah, and also a bit of lost footage at the beginning, as you know. So that's really why uh, this episode is a little bit shorter, but next time we've got a big project to start. So I will see you then. See ya, bye. I can fly, I can fly. It's amazing. I like the flying. Many, many flying. Flying, yay! Bye. Ah! Hello, I'm Plod Plod and I'm playing Mr. Beardstone's Perfect World Mod Pack and this is episode 11. Last time out we retextured our starter home and turned it into this here wonderful workshop. We also tamed and named our horse. There he is. We also set up our network of waystones and I hinted that I had a big project in mind for this episode. So I guess we should get on with that. Now of all the mods in the pack, there's one that I've pretty much ignored up till now and that is Farmer's Delight. We've got all these extra bits and pieces like tomatoes, cabbages, onions and these wonderful crates that you can make with them. But there's much more to Farmer's Delight than that. There's a whole load of exciting recipes that we can make including some yummy treats like hamburgers and chocolate. So I want to set myself up a Farmer's Delight kitchen with all the things I need to make those and, of course, a farm to actually farm all of these. Because this automatic vegetable farm behind me is doing great. It's doing really, really well. But it is just a starter farm, really. And I think we need to scale it up a bit. And I don't really want to do that here in my industrial area. This is kind of for other farms, for kind of more... I don't know, stony, metally, those kind of farms and yeah, and woody farms. So I want to go and find a whole new area to make a farmhouse, a massive farm and uh, grain silos and things to store things in. And of course, some power sources, because so far we've used water wheels for absolutely everything. And it's about time we started to change that, too. So we're not going to get everything done in this episode, but we are going to go and find our new area and make a start. Behind me is the church that contains our portal that leads to the nether fortress and in front of me there's just lots and lots of planes. It's a great area. Let's have a little run around here. It's reasonably flat already. I think this is where we want to make our farm. I want to make it far enough away from the village so that we don't end up with the villagers coming and interfering with it but I reckon an area like this could do us well could do perfectly. It needs a bit of flattening to start off with though so let's get the machines out and do that. So I've been busy flattening out this area you can see there used to be a hill here and uh, well there isn't anymore and I've also popped in a waystone. Now as this is going to be a rural area I decided to go for the mossy variant of it. If I fly over here a little bit this is a bit difficult so flying in, in F5 mode uh, you can see there are a few places like here for example where I've tried to blend this uh, this area into the landscape uh, but we will kind of fly backwards yeah over behind me there's a few bits where yeah I've still got a bit more landscaping to do and it's kind of the land's just hovering in midair a little bit but we'll sort all that out in due course yeah, no, I can't land well like this. But if I pop into free cam, that might be a better way to look around. So we've got quite a big flat area over here. And, uh, well, we need, to, we need to put a farm here, really. We can obviously extend it out a little bit more if we need to. I'm not quite sure exactly how much space we're going to need. Maybe I should explain what the plan is. So we are going to have a farmhouse with a farmer's delight kitchen inside it. But we're also going to have a field for each type of crop. So your cabbages, your onions, your carrots, potatoes, all of those things. And each field is going to have its own tractor, which will actually be a train. And that tractor will be harvesting the crops. 
and then we need a bit of transport to bring all that stuff back to a kind of central storage area which will be linked to the farmhouse so we can get all the bits and then we'd also need a bit of transport to take things over to our main storage and the way we're going to do that is we'll have another vehicle that goes from over here it will take it over to our portal which is in the church which has just gone out of view behind me there you go it's just popping in there so and then we'll take the train from there through the nether over to our main base that's kind of my plan so it's going to take quite a few episodes to do all of this and quite a lot of planning out and of course there's every chance that what i actually end up building will be nothing like what i've just described but that's minecraft for you by the way in order to flatten the landscape a bit i made myself this portable drill which was a little bit faster than laying the tracks and all the rest of it that we needed for our minecart contraptions look what it can do and having completed the farmer's delight quest in order to get all of these lovely things it's time to go and build a house to put them in thing I've always wanted to do in Minecraft is make some kind of Tudory timber frame building like this one and obviously I haven't been able to do that without you know, framed blocks so we can make this kind of shape so I'm really pleased that with these frame blocks we can make exactly this kind of thing I mean it could still be jankier and kind of more wobbly but there's only so far you can go but yeah I'm really pleased with the way this has turned out and this muddy area out here is what I want to turn into a farmyard we might extend that and bonk a duck pond or something into it at some point but first let me go inside because well there's nothing in here it's just a big empty space at the moment with a, with a staircase that goes up so we need to decorate this place and obviously we want to put our kitchen in i'm not exactly brilliant at minecraft interiors but let me show you what i've done so just around the corner here we've got our kitchen so we've got our all important farmer's delight bits here and the rest of it is kind of just for decoration so these are kind of extractor fan type things above the uh, above the stoves here yeah they're not they're not shoots they're extractor fans all right <laughs> and we've got a nice dining table here look how posh those seats are over here we've got a little bit of a kind of reading nook where we can sit and read our books and of course we've got a nice big sofa so we can sit here and watch the telly and of course the upstairs is fully decorated as well of course it is you don't need to see it i don't believe what i'm hearing well okay if you insist it's a large open plan sleeping room thing there you go i'm sleeping in it see it's a bedroom honest in all seriousness though i probably will come and decorate this at some point i've put in some bedside tables here without the bed in the middle and uh, this place i want to try and make some kind of a, a bathroom maybe i don't know and um yeah we have, there's actually room for another story as well but you know don't really want to make more work for myself if i don't have to out here in the farmyard i've managed to rope a couple of chickens in here and we'll do that a little bit more and what i want to do is make a bit of a duck pond in this area and for that i'm gonna need some mud so let's head home and make some and making mud in crate mud is pretty easy all we need to do is chuck some dirt into a basin and then mix it together with some water the only problem with that is it's a little bit tedious because it takes 16 buckets of water to make one stack of mud so it's definitely something i might want to automate if i'm going to use a lot of mud in the future there we are one completed duck pond and i've added a bit of grass to this farmyard area too so that's our farmhouse and our farmyard done and i'm really pleased with the way that's looking so our next job is to add some fields 
Whoops, that's a slight water placement derp. That's looking better. And now we've sorted our field out, we need to sort out the tractor that's going to harvest the crops. The tractor is actually going to be secretly a train that's going to be running on rails that go underneath the field. And I don't just want to use the normal rails, I want narrow rails so that we can get a sharper turn involved. So if I pop in here, I put in a new door and I've just changed the way that this produces the rails a bit so we only need one deployer but we need two mechanical saws so we're turning the full blocks into slabs and then we're cutting the slabs and they form these kind of partially created narrow rails then they just need a nugget deployed on them and that makes our narrow rails if you're looking for them in the create inventory by the way they're called tracks in there not rails in case the wording gets confusing i mean tracks rails same thing right so with the narrow tracks all made i've dug down underneath the field and i've placed the tracks down here in a figure of eight formation which means it's time for the bit that to be honest i've been dreading actually making a tractor this is going to be hard. Down here I'm going to place a station and I'm going to make sure that is in build mode. Then I can just chuck a train casing on the tracks down here and that creates our bogies. And I'm going to use glass panes to connect that bogey to where I'm going to build a tractor above the ground up here. Well it might not be the best looking tractor in the world but it's kind of tractor-ish. It at least kind of resembles a tractor. <laughs> That's the main thing. So obviously we've got a couple of wheels on each side. We've got some barrels underneath and a portable storage interface under there. Up on top we've got our seat and our controls. So we've got a complete working uh, rail contraption here and of course we've got our panels on the back. So this should actually work. That's the main thing. All we need now is to give it a driver and a schedule and, well, see what happens. You'll do. Come with me. Okay, the driver's installed. Before we can do anything else, so we actually need to glue all of this together. So let's get those buttons on. Looks like we can move. Have we left anything behind? Yes, we've left the back of the cab behind. And we're harvesting, look at this. Oh, we're not harvesting. Okay. Why are we not harvesting? And if you're shouting at the screen that what I've got on here are plows and what I should have on here are harvesters, then of course you are absolutely right. That's a bit more like it. So of course with my figure of eight we're going to be missing out quite a bit of crops in the middle here. So I might do something about that but I'm not too worried because we're going to get enough wheat anyway from this. But what I do need to do now is move my station from down here to somewhere on the figure of eight so that we can then schedule it to drop some stuff off. So I put my station up at the end there so that it's away from our little road so we're able to put our storage over there. And I set it up as a schedule so now this chap should just follow it. Round we go. It should stop about here somewhere. There we go. And it will actually stay stopped because I put a condition on it that will only carry on if it's completely empty. So now we need to put in our storage. The advantage of using these item drains means I don't need any belts in here, so that saves a bit of lag, but it also means I don't need any power in order to unload the uh, stuff into this shipping container here. As you can see, that's loading up. We've only got the andesite funnels here. I just didn't have any brass ones to hand, so it's only doing one item at a time, which is a little bit slow. But actually, slow is okay, because we need a bit of time for all this stuff to grow up again anyway. I am just going to hang around a little while though, just to make sure that it does go round again when it has finally unloaded. No, it's not moving, so I'm just going to go and grab myself another train station from home. Hello there, chaps. Oh, now it seems to be working. I mean, it is going very fast, we just need to slow it down a bit. And it's my only other problem is it sounds a lot like a train. <laughs> it looks like a tractor. I don't think we can do much about that though. There we are, so I've set the speed down to 10% of what it would normally be doing, and it looks a lot more reasonable. Here's something a little bit strange though. Earlier on, we saw that we had hundreds of items in our portable storage interface coming away into this container. And now, 
Look at it, there's only 30 odd bits of wheat and seeds. Don't know what's happened to the rest. But the good news is we now have a fully operational working concept for how to do the rest of our farm. We can make similar fields for other crops and of course we can expand this to make up a bigger area because it does seem a little bit silly having a big tractor going around a little field. And looking at the view from up here on the roof of my house we can see we've got no shortage of space to play with to make all of our fields and things so we certainly don't have to limit ourselves to that kind of field size. So the plan for the next episode is to create a whole load more fields just like this one and a transport network so another vehicle coming around the farm to collect the goodies from these containers like this one for each field and take them to a central place. But right now I am so pleased with my house, my farmyard, with my pond and my chickens and my field and my working tractor. I've achieved everything I wanted to do in this episode and I am so delighted with it. So I'm going to quit while I'm ahead and I'll see you next time. In this overpowered episode, we make an overpowered wand that can place blocks in an overpowered way. We go to the nether, that's always fun. We make an overpowered enchanter and an overpowered mega torch, a sort of overpowered blaze burner machine, a very much overpowered steam engine and a not at all overpowered rice farm. We also realise we've been in the world for over a thousand days now. I'm Plod Plod, this is Mr Beardstone's Perfect World Mod Pack and it's time to hand over to Pass Me to do the proper introduction. Hey, welcome back. Last time out we made this farmhouse, this farmyard and this farm field with this farming tractor doing the farming things. But right now we are only farming the one crop in quite a small field and we need to expand it out into all of this space. And to make that expansion a little bit easier, I'm going to make myself a diamond wand. Just like that. That's like insanely easy. And what this allows me to do is just to select an area and place a whole load of blocks down really, really quickly. But I've realized that's taking quite a bit of durability damage already. So I probably need to enchant that with mending and unbreaking. And of course for that, I'm going to need some books like this one here, which will cost me 34 emeralds, which right now I don't have. I can get them by trading with these guys. But also, there's a whole load of stuff in Create. Let's get out of here because it's a bit noisy. There we go. There's a whole load of stuff in Create around enchanting and disenchanting and stuff. And I'm pretty sure that once we've got an enchantment, there's a way of replicating that enchantment. Here we go. This is the thing. So I can use an enchanting guide on a blaze burner to make a blaze enchanter. And that should enable us to enchant some stuff. To make an enchanting guide, all I need is a book and a sturdy sheet, just like that. We're also going to need a blaze burner and I've only got an empty one. So that means we need to go off to the nether and find a blaze to put in it. Here, blazy blazy. No, not like that. There we are. Okay, so I've got my blaze enchanter now set up and it's going to be pulling the experience from our fluid tank here. I think what I've got to do is right click on there with the tool I want to enchant. That sounds like it's doing something. And now that's enchanted with mending. That's brilliant. And I've still got a mending book. Okay, so now I should be able to get the enchanting guide out from there and switch it to unbreaking. Now I've got an unbreaking book. So that is now an unbreaking guide. Pop that back in there. So now if I pop that in there, do we get unbreaking and mending or is it going to just overwrite the mending? Additional order. Mending and unbreaking. Perfect. So now I can get back to placing more dirt. I'm back at base to repair my tools and this wandering trader here has appeared. Erwin. Erwin is offering me a mangrove propagule, which we don't have any of. So yes, please, Erwin. I would very much like one of those. Don't wander off. Thanks, just the one should do. I'll just get another one just to be safe. Thank you, Erwin. Your work here is done. For tool repair, I've just put in this little shower here so I can put the tool in my offhand. In this case, I want to repair my sword. 
the spinner wheel, and there we go, one fully repaired sword. And I've also made sure that I can stand on the disenchanter to put my levels back into the tank. And meanwhile, the zombies are still having a wonderful time in there, giving us all the experience to put in there. So this is great. I'm really loving this setup. The only thing I can't enchant with this is actually the super glue. So if I try it and right click on it, then obviously it's going to try and stick it together, which is not what I want. Um, and if I shift and right click, yeah, it doesn't do anything at all. So I can't seem to get my super glue into the blaze enchanter. I might be able to do it with some belts and things maybe that's what i need to try but for now i mean we've got plenty of uh, slime anyway so it's not as if i need to worry about super glue being mending and unbreaking and all those things enough mucking about over there though i've got a farm to expand so now i've got a much bigger field i've been hard at work making all this stuff and plowing it and getting the water sources in the right place and all that kind of thing but now i've got a bit of a decision to make because my original intention was to have a field for each crop with a separate tractor harvesting each of them uh, and that way I could keep everything separate when we got to the storage but actually I'm not entirely sure I want to do that because we can easily separate things in the storage with the storage drawers and so on and we know that things grow a little bit faster certainly in Java edition if the crops are in lines of alternate crops and things like that so, and it might just be easier if we use one big field instead of lots of little fields. So I'm going to plant this bit of a field up with some more wheat. And then I'm going to do a row of tomatoes next to some cabbage. Chuck in some carrots. Oh, we might eat some on the way. Why not? Good old potatoes and some tasty onions. We'll even chuck in some beetroot, although actually I don't have much of that. So with the field all planted up, the next thing I need to do is get down underneath it and reroute the tractor so that it's going to harvest the entire thing. And getting underneath it is pretty straightforward because, well, we haven't done the landscaping yet, so we can just go under here. So we're having created lots more tracks and placed them all down. I think I've got a way that should harvest pretty much the entire field. And of course, the only way to check that out is to give the chicken a schedule and see what happens. Well, it turns out the tractor was missing quite a bit and that's mainly because it was skipping some of the tracks. So I've put down some more stations and put them in order and added them to the schedule just to make sure it goes everywhere we want it to go. But now we've got another problem and that's that the tractor doesn't have enough storage to collect all of the crops. And we're going to solve our storage problem on that tractor by adding some barrels. But why not make the barrels fancy barrels? I didn't even realise we could do this. Uh, so we've got all these chip barrels that we can choose from. Hmm, choices, decisions, decisions. I've decided to go with these reinforced spruce crates. I think they'll go reasonably well with things. I'll give the chicken its schedule back and we should get back onto the field. Oops. Oh yeah, it goes quite fast to begin with, I forgot that. And just looking at our shipping container, we can see that all the wheat that we'd collected has once again disappeared. So we definitely need to do something about these disappearing items. So a big thank you to Sacharella or Sacarella, I'm not sure, quite sure how it's pronounced, but thank you anyway for pointing out that Foxy No Tail had exactly the same problem with these shipping containers with disappearing items. And if I swap this out for a proper storage cargo vault, uh, you know, an item vault in other words, don't know why I put all those extra words in, then that should solve the problem. The last little issue I had to solve was with this little strip of wheat in the middle here where actually there wasn't a track that was harvesting it. Uh, so I've just made the tracks sort of wobble backwards and forwards along this way. It looks a little bit strange, but you know, it does the trick. That's the main thing, right? So that's the planty side of the farm done. But while I was clearing all this out under here and putting the tracks down and all the rest of it, I had to plant, well plant, I had to place many, many torches. Look at all these. But it doesn't have to be this way. And that's because there's this thing called the Mega Torch that we can craft. And you might think this looks quite expensive, but it doesn't have to be expensive because I've decided to set myself a little challenge. And that is to try and make a Mega Torch using only logs and cobblestone. So looking again at the recipe, we're gonna need diamonds. We're gonna need gold. We're going to need stripped, uh, stripped wood and torches. So the stripped wood, well that's easy enough. We can really easily do that. Let's just place some of these down. 
And hey presto, we've got stripped wood. For the torches, we're just going to need some sticks. So for that, we'll make some planks, convert them into sticks. And of course, we're going to need some coal or some charcoal. So if I get the rest of those and pop them on there, that should turn it into charcoal. Or do I need to put it in there? I can't remember. Let's split it half and half. There you go. You can have some and you can have some. At least one of those is going to turn into charcoal. I think it's this one. Yep, yeah, it's that one. But now we can just make some torches. And yeah, I've already got some in my inventory, but that's not the point. There we go, plenty of torches. So now I need to make the gold and the diamonds. Let's start with the gold, shall we? And how am I going to make the gold? Well, it's going to come from ingots, which are actually going to come from the nuggets. And the nuggets are going to come from washing some red sand. And the red sand is going to come from crushing some terracotta. And we'll get terracotta from clay, which will come from the clay balls, which will come from crushing some gravel. And we can get gravel, obviously, by crushing some cobblestone. Let's put a whole stack in there, shall we? So there's my gravel coming out, and that's going to go straight back in again. And that should give us some clay. There's some clay. Not very much, but there's some. So with our clay, we can obviously make some uh, clay, like that kind of clay. Okay, so now we crush the terracotta and that gives us a bit of red sand. And if we wash the red sand, we should get some gold. Here we go. That took two stacks of cobblestone to get one gold nugget. Also another way of making gold from this stuff. So we can take our sand out of here and we can haunt that, which means we use the blue fiery stuff. And that should turn that into soul sand, which we can then wash and get more gold out of it. There we are, gold. So that's my long-winded way of making gold from cobblestone. But what about those diamonds? Well, for that, we're going to need some charcoal. So we can put some uh, some of our logs under the lava here. Then what we can do is we can turn that charcoal into coal. And turn that coal into blocks. Then if I swap out our depot here for a basin, a bowl, whatever it is basin that's the one and I pop some lava into that basin and then drop my block of coal in there you go it gets crushed into a diamond but while I've proven the principle it's going to take absolutely ages to get the gold I need for that so uh yeah I'm, I'm gonna cheat of course I am got plenty of gold and then that should be enough to make our mega torch yes look at that but as well as a bit of fun all that goes to show that just with a tree farm and a cobblestone generator we could actually make a mega torch farm if we wanted to but anyway now that we've got a mega torch let's plonk it down here on our teleporter what's it do Bree? and with the sun going down i could stay here all night long and no hostile mobs would spawn now you might be tempted to think that we are done with our crop farm with our tractor and all the crops in the big field but you'd be wrong and that's because we are not harvesting rice or melons or pumpkins now rice wants to be planted in a block of water so that's why i've created this massive pool here but that raises the question of how i'm going to harvest it and for that i want to use a gantry for no other reason that i haven't used one yet before so a gantry is basically the straight line linear version of one of these spinny round jobbies and just like the spinny round jobbies they are going to need power to work and in the last episode, when we were first making our farm area, I said I wasn't going to use water wheels. So as an alternative, we could use wind power like the villagers do. But I mean, villagers, look how silly they are. I don't want to be like them. So that means it's time for me to enter the steam age. For that, we are going to need a source of heat, like those ones there, and a source of water. Oh, look. So a cog on there and a handle on it just to get some water going into our machine to begin with. Well, it's not a machine yet, it's just a tank. And we get an advancement because we're collecting some water, yay. So now I should just be able to put a steam engine on there. And I need to click on that with a shaft, which I don't have. Shaft crisis averted. Um, it's not turning round. And it doesn't seem to matter how much I crank this handle to put water in here. As soon as I stop cranking it, 
the thing just doesn't seem to have enough power to stay self-sufficient to pump its own water into the tank and I've tried it with one steam engine on here and with two and it seems to make no difference it just kind of goes into passive mode and idle mode and basically literally runs out of steam maybe steam engines aren't for me at the moment although if i were to replace these campfires with blaze burners that might help but i don't have any empty blaze burners or any blazes to put in them to make them proper blaze burners and as that's a recurring problem maybe it's about time i do something about it so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna head to the nether and instead of trying to find blazes I'm going to try and find a blaze spawner and bring it back. First though, Fredda has arrived and Fredda has sea pickles and pointed dripstone and actually drip leaves. I like all of those things please. All of them, all of them. Now that I've got the blaze spawner safely back to the overworld, and I can actually change my helmet back as well. There we go. Uh, yeah, now that it's back here, I've been having a little think about what I want to do with it. Because I've got three criteria that it needs to meet. One is that I don't want blazes spawning absolutely everywhere and ruining my base. Two is that I actually want to get some blaze rods out of it, so it needs to be in a farm that will do that. And three is that I want to get my blaze burners populated, if that's the right word, with the blazes when we need to. And I want to do that safely so that I don't have to kind of venture into the mob farm in order to do it. And I've got a plan. So in a nutshell, I'm going to put the blaze spawner in the farm behind me, but we're going to make some modifications to make it work to, to do the things we want it to do. The plan is that the blaze spawner will go where the jack-o'-lantern is on top of those two zombie spawners there. And as you can see, we've got this extra bit down here. So what I'm going to do is empty blaze burners can go into this barrel here. They will pop out a black funnel into that funnel and into our deployer, which will give them a poke into the blaze burner. That will give us actual blaze burners, so into the blaze spawner, I should have said. That will give us actual blaze burners with blazes in them. And they will come out of this funnel here, roll along here, into that funnel there, and into this barrel over here. Hey, it's Plod from the future here, and I'm just here to tell you that this andesite funnel we're looking at needs to be a brass funnel with a filter on it. Otherwise, the deployer won't get enough time to put the blazes into the empty blaze burners, and we'll just get empty blaze burners coming out. In order to get the blaze spawner on top of these two zombie spawners, we're going to need to move both zombie spawners and create essentially a new contraption with the blaze spawner on top, and then put the whole thing back again. So first I'm placing the blaze spawner here and now I can put the two zombie spawners underneath it. So now all I've got to do is glue all three of those together and create a new minecart contraption that's got all of them in. But then I can just chuck that back in here, remove my temporary blocks, stick the roof back on and we should be done. Well while I was putting the roof on up there we were definitely getting plenty of blazes spawning. There's a whole load more. You can see them getting damage in the water as they go down. And yeah, when they reach down here, pretty much one hit kills, as we saw, they're not lasting long at all, which is perfect. There is only one problem, and that's that I completely forgot to power the deployer. For a finishing touch, I've decided to bring the full blaze burners out here and bring them back round to where I'm standing by the input barrel. So let's just put another couple in, shall we? There we go. And they should go through and roll out and come back to me. There's one, two. Excellent. So now that I've got my blaze burners, I can swap out these campfires under here to uh, to get a better fuel source going in to our steam engine. But actually, I've been having second thoughts. So I had made a deal with myself that I wouldn't use any water wheels in this area, and I decided it was time to have a renegotiation. So I said, what if I do allow myself some water wheels in this area? 
And I said, no, can't have any water wheels in this area. And I said, but hold on, just listen to me for a second. No, no, no water wheels in this area. Oh, but hold on, if I am allowed some water wheels in this area, I could then swap out all the water wheels I've got in the other areas for proper steam engines. So you mean no water wheels in the other areas? Yes, that's what I mean. Water wheels here and not in the other areas. Hmm, okay. That's a deal. So there you are. I've got, I've got a deal with myself. It's, it's that easy. So basically, I'm going to get rid of the steam engine from here. Mainly because if I do put the blaze burners in here, then I'm going to need a fuel source to keep it going all the time. And I don't want to bother with that here. It's the wrong place for it. But over in the industrial area and back at my home base, that's a far more appropriate area for those kind of things. And those are the places where I'm going to need a lot more power than I'm going to need here. So the steam engine just for this farm would be overpowered. So therefore, a water wheel would be far more appropriate for this particular thing. So back here on the home island, I have got all of these water wheels powering all these things to keep the mob farm going. All of these water wheels, which are just powering the, uh, the lift that goes down to the station. All of these water wheels, look at this, it's ridiculous. Many, many water wheels. We're going to need a source of fuel for our blaze burners that will be powering our steam engines. And that's what this lava tank is going to be used for. But I need to fill it up because it's pretty empty at the moment and I can go to the nether and fill up my buckets and bring them back but that's quite time consuming and of course there's a better way so basically with the tank upgrade for a backpack I can turn the storage into a backpack into fluid storage I don't really know how it's going to work but I'll try it and find out well I think we're also going to want a pump upgrade which is going to be the thing that pumps the fluids between the tank upgrades and the other blocks and after a lot of fiddling around trying to get the pump upgrade to work I ended up putting an advanced pump upgrade on the backpack as well and now it's filling up with lava which is great so with a whole load of lava transferred into my fluid tank I could start the steam engine by placing down some newly filled blaze burners and I connected those up to the fluid tank using these pipes and although the pumping of the lava will eventually be done by the steam engine itself for now I hooked that up to the existing power supply from the water wheels. Then I built up the fluid tank on top and then I stole that pipe in order to take it to the ocean to fill up the whole tank with water. Then I realised that was too far away so I made an infinite water source a bit nearer. That was enough to get the steam engine going so we switched the power source for those pumps to the steam engine itself and it was producing more than enough stress units to power my entire workshop and that meant I could dismantle all the water wheels that had been powering it before. I extended the power underground so that it could reach our lift, which was a little bit janky because I had to go all the way around the lift shaft in order to do it. Then I took a long time building a dry tunnel through the water underneath the reclaimed bits of the island to the mob farm, where again I'd managed to get rid of all the water wheels and make the whole power supply look a lot neater. I even used the steam engine to power the contraption unloader and the crafting wall which didn't even have power before. With our island all steam powered, now we're allowed to use water wheels in the rice farm. So something like this should do the trick. We've got the water wheel in here spinning around connected to a speed controller and that will set this thing spinning and that should then move this gantry carriage along with these harvesters attached. These things by the way are just barrels, they're just decorated ones. And at the far end we've got a portable storage interface which will take items out of there and pop them into that barrel there. Hopefully if I split this lever everything should work. Oh yeah, I said it to go really slow. Let's speed it up a little bit. Well, it's harvesting. That's good news. Well, it's taken me quite a while to figure out how to make it keep going backwards and forwards. And in the end, I ended up using a sequenced gear shift and a good old-fashioned redstone circuit. So it works, but it looks pretty janky and out of place, and actually this is going to be in the way of my road when it comes along here. So I do need to reconfigure it a little bit and maybe move more of it down underground so there's less of the mechanical stuff visible. But at least we've got a, a working concept going on here. So what's next? Well, the answer to that is over this way. Oh, I forgot I was going to fly then. Uh... Behind the house, behind the house, uh, here, there it is. So I've started a mum, mumpkin, a mumpkin and pelon farm. That's what this is. Yes, all the mumpkins and the pelons, we like them. Yeah, there's uh, there's pumpkins on this side and melons over here, or maybe it's the other way around. 
I don't really know. Uh, but yeah, and I've put them out in lines like this so that they should grow along these grassy bits here. I know that normally you would make like a crosshatch kind of design with a mump pumpkin and melon farm i really can't say it properly now uh, but yeah i've gone to make it in lines so that that'll be a lot easier for us to harvest with a gantry or a minecart minecart contraption or um, an extended piston we haven't played with those yet but also i'm conscious i've got no flax that's something that you can grow it's a farmer's delight thing and i don't have any of it in my big vast field over here and i really want to get some and as you can see, all this is finished growing. It's all nice and ripe for harvesting, but it's not being harvested because my storage is now full. So I now need to work out actually what I'm going to do with all this stuff. By the way, during the making of the rice farm, we flipped over the 1000 day mark. So we've been going over 1000 days in this world now, and that means we need to make a movie about it. So watch out for that coming soon. And as well as all that, I want to explore infinite lava sources for our shiny new steam engine at our home island, and also to put a steam engine in our industrial district, and a bit of shiny clever transport between the two of them. So lots and lots to do, but in this episode, no time to do it. So it's all going to have to wait for next time. And yeah, I might try and clean up that, uh, that good old rice farm over there and make it look a little bit better between episodes. Will I will actually get that done between episodes? Or will that be the first thing I do next episode? Well, you'll have to tune in and find out, won't you? Bye. So there you have it. Four and a half hours of your time, six months of my time and over a thousand in-game days. And we've still got lots more to do. So if you don't want to miss out, do hit that all-important subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next episode and maybe in the next Thousand Days movie too. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.